Eligibility, okay. So we know that we can't do everything in the eligibility form before the meeting because that would be predetermination, right? So we can't do that, but I'll show you what we will do. So let's go ahead and hit, click on create. And the reason is reevaluation. Okay, so basically what we do in an eligibility determination, and this is where we are in our training presentation, is that we can do a meeting notice, we can set that up in our eligibility, and then we can also send the blank eligibility pages home, okay, with the evaluation prior to the meeting. Why would we want to send the evaluation home prior to the meeting? Yeah, parents can read it. You can call them up and explain it. You can go all through the evaluation so that when you get to the eligibility meeting, you could say, hey, mom, you've already gotten the evaluation, and I think I answered all your questions. Are we good about the evaluation? And hopefully the parents will say, yeah, I understand it. Great, let's talk about eligibility. You have just saved yourself a huge, long reevaluation. How many of you have ever sat through an IEP eligibility and everybody has to read the report? and it goes forever. Yeah, I hate that. So give time to parents to process the information. It's a lot, it's overload for parents to get that evaluation all in reporting out at the meeting. So send it home prior to the meeting with their procedural safeguards and copies of blank eligibility pages. Why do we send that home? can't write it beforehand and we need to let the parents know what eligibility criteria we are looking at. Now for a reevaluation, if the student's already in special ed, how many eligibility pages do we need to send home? Just one, right? The, the eligibility that they probably, you're considering. Unless you're at a reevaluation and you say, ooh, we're gonna be looking at maybe a secondary this time. If you're looking at a secondary, you send both home. What do you think you would do on an initial? What would happen if I sent home one disability page? What will the parent assume? Predetermination. <laughs> You're only considering one disability category area for an initial? Yeah, you can find yourself in, in trouble for that. So you need to send at minimum two eligibility pages, blank eligibility, at an initial to say, hey, these are some of the eligibility, this is some of the disability categories we're looking at. You can send more than one, more than two, depending upon, what, or excuse me, more than two, you could do two or three, depending upon what you're looking at as far as eligibility. But you cannot send just one home for an initial. You can send two, you can do that for a reval, they're already spent but you cannot do it for an initial, okay? So parents need a copy of this and two eligibility worksheets, and it's done, all the eligibility determination is done at the meeting, and it's finalized at the meeting, okay? So we're gonna go through two modes. I'm gonna pretend that we're gonna start it like you just got consent. So we're gonna start the eligibility. So we're gonna go to our create eligibility determination. If you can get those summative assessment worksheets out, what is our date that we're using? 7-1. So our start date is 7-1. And that just says, when did I start the form? Okay. Then the next thing that you're going to do is say, create new meeting. And now it's going to populate a notice of meeting. Okay. So when's, when's the date of the meeting? on our form 719 so we're going 719 did you say creating yes. on a Saturday you're working on a Saturday why do you think it prompted for 5 o'clock p.m. Oh, right it automatic the program knows what time it is right now and it automatically resets to the next hour so pay attention to that <laughs> um, you can reset it for any time 
Um, and then it'll give you the location. The location is based off the student's school that's in IC and also in Enrich. So you can actually add to that section if you wanted to say a specific room for the parent. You can put in there like room 21. You can actually add to that line to indicate where you're actually meeting. Now look where, who populated? Who populated in that meeting? Me and Rebecca and the parents. Why? It's on your team, right? Remember I told you that it's a shortcut? If you have all your team members, they automatically populate, and all you have to do is assign their roles. Pretty nice, right? So I'm going to assign roles to those people. So Rebecca will be the moderate needs teacher. And I'll be the special ed designee. So let's talk about who are the required participants for a reevaluation. Gen ed teacher, special ed designee. Does it have to be an admin? No. no. It doesn't, because those were the old days where admins were the only ones that actually could make decisions about services and programs and all those pieces. Now, your administrators empower you to do that. So you can sign as a special ed designee, and you can sign as a moderate needs teacher, okay? Would we put our name in again? As if you want your name to pre-populate in, in two spaces, you'll need to put your name in twice with those different roles. If not, you can sign, for, sign on both lines if you don't want them pre-populated, okay? Um, who else needs to be at a reevaluation? Yeah, people that have done the evaluation. Absolutely. Who else? Parents. Parents would be really nice, but not required. <laughs> but you want them there. Who else? Yeah, no, we said Gen Ed. Gen Ed. Yeah. yeah, you want the student, especially if they're 15 plus, you want them there for sure. Um, but what about people providing services? Yeah, anybody. Yeah, anybody providing services should be there as well. And what if a student is receiving special ed transportation? Yeah, you need it, not the bus driver, you need to invite the, the transportation department, the scheduler for your area. Because we review transportation every year at the annual. And so if you're doing a special education transportation, you need to invite the transportation person. Because they know where the routes are and the times and all that piece, they can tell you. And they need to hear what's going on with that kid, especially if they have a behavior intervention plan or other pieces like that. Now, will they come to every meeting? Don't know. But you have to invite them. OK? What happens if they don't? What happens if they don't is just you just need to be in contact and communication with them to say, um, this is, this is, um, uh, what we decided at the IEP meeting, the student does qualify for special ed services. Can you give me some more information? Can we share it on a different time? But you do want to invite them to your meetings. And we only do transportation at the annual. It's only good for the school year, and then we have to reset for another school year. Yeah. So then every oh. No, go ahead. Is there anybody that cannot be the designee? Is there anybody that can't be the designee? Because you have to identify one, right? A special ed designee? Yes. Is there People, anyone that we cannot put there? Yeah, gen ed teacher cannot be the designee. Okay. It, it's almost always a special ed personnel. Mm -hmm. So an SLP, any a special, an EA can't be a designee. An educational assistant cannot be. Question? Um, so what you're saying then is that we invite them during an annual or a try or every, I mean, at every meeting. At if every meeting that you're considering special ed transportation. Thank you for clarifying that. What if they had special ed transportation, but they were getting rid of it? Like the only reason they had it was because of their brother. So the question is, um, what, if, what if you had special, ed, special transportation and you're getting rid of it because the only time, the only reason why they had it was because of their brother or sibling? which we have had some problems, we have to clean that up, then no, you don't need to invite them. But you do need to inform them that you are removing the special education transportation and let them know, hey, by now we had this IEP, you no longer qualifies for transportation, please take them off your lists. Mm -hmm. 
Becca? So is this a good time to talk about the IEP team member excusal form? Yes, I was getting to that, thank you. So now I'm gonna put in, so I'm gonna put in my, some people. Now to add more people, I have to click on add person, and then who do you think all these people are? What's that? Where do you think those, that list came from? What's that? Yeah, there's lots of names there. So those names are pre-populated from the student's schedule. Those are all their gen ed teachers. So from high school, you'll have seven teachers there that pre-populate because they're coming from all their teachers. So it's nice that they're already there. You can select those gen ed teachers right there. Okay? But what if the person that you want to invite is not on that list? Okay? If they're not on that list, then you would go ahead to add a different person. And then you're going to search for their name. Now, please, 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 and Rebecca's going to plead with you too, please look for the person's last name. We have lots of people that go by different names, like Ron Wood. He is an example. He is an elementary coordinator in Highlands Ranch. His first name is Herbert. But everybody searches for him for Ron, because that's how he goes by, and they can't find him, because they're looking for Ron Wood. So if you look for Wood, you'll find all the Woods that are employees in our district, and then you'll find Ron Wood and add him to a meeting. If you are manually adding, Rebecca has to go in and manually merge every day you do that. It's a lot of work. So don't manually add any people unless you absolutely have to. If you can't find a person, you email Rebecca. Hey, I can't find this person. Can you add them? Because we can add personnel, like maybe advocates or maybe a separate guardian that's not on a list. We can manually add them in, but if you do it, she has to go in and merge. We had like 30 merges yesterday. I was like, ugh, why are these people adding? <laughs> and I can't take it off because there are times that you really need it but I think people are abusing it. So look for the person's last name. Yes, John. If it's a non-school personnel person, an, an advocate or a, a uncle right. or whatever, call you guys. Email like, Rebecca and okay. she'll add them. And will they be on the list from then on? Yes. Okay. We will add them into our system. Andy's got a question too. Can you explain why a person that is a new counselor at my school would be in one person's enriched program, but not in mine. Why would somebody's be in your... A new counselor at our school... Yeah. ...is in our social workers enriched, because she and I were talking about this earlier today, but when I looked for him, looked for him just by last name, last name, first name, he wasn't in my enriched. Because that social worker might have manually added her. Oh. And that's the kind of people I'm frustrated with. <laughs> yes. Hey, so you can so, erase that part of the video. So I would say that if you want, if you, if you can't find a person, and you've searched by last name and all that piece, email Rebecca. She'll find them. She has access to the whole district. She can manually add them. And that way they're in there forever. So you can use, we have tons of advocates that I've already put in there that we use a lot of the same, parents use a lot of the same advocates. So look for that person's last name. Okay, so if I'm going to search for, for Ron, if, if I wanted to add Ron to this meeting, I would just search for wood. And so it's going to give me all the woods, wood, 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 and where did I put Herbert? Maybe I didn't put Adam in, yeah, Herbert Wood. So I haven't added his like, I haven't added his like Ron Wood <laughs> in there. And sometimes you might ask somebody, hey, do you go by a different first name? Or maybe you're going by a different name altogether, okay? If you absolutely have to, you're doing it right now on the fly in the meeting and there is no way that you can get a hold of Rebecca, you, the way that you do manually add is when you say add a different person and it says if you cannot find, enter their contact information. But once you get to this point, then now she's going to have to merge four people, which is we know that's going to happen sometimes, but we hate to do it all the time, okay? All right, so um, invite the student, yes or no. Okay. So one of the things that we want to talk about excusals is if 
you put a person on the notice of meeting, you have now obligated them to that meeting. Mm -hmm. And now that parent assumes that that person will be there. So be careful when you do your notice of meetings and check in with your people and go, hey, you're going to make that meeting, right? You're going to make that meeting? Great, I'm going to put you on the notice of meeting. If they come back to you and go, oh my gosh, I can't make it, i got to go to this training, then you're going to say, I can't take you off because I've already sent the notice of meeting home to parents. You will now have to fill out this nice long excusal form and get mom to sign and say it's okay that you're not there. So that's what I say. You really do need to check in with your staff before you put your notice of meeting on. Because legally, if we don't have that excusal form signed by the parent, we could also be out of compliance for our district. So you have to, whoever is on that notice of meeting, must have an excusal form. We used to say, just remove it, but we found out that legally we can't do that. So we must have an excusal form. So how we get an excusal form is, say for example, um, Rebecca tells me, or has, kids are sick, right? Kids were up puking all last night and she can't come to the meeting. Out of her control, so I just click on absent, check, and all of a sudden, do you notice on that left side, do you see where it says, our Schattinger team member excusal? As soon as I click on that absent, the excusal form will automatically populate. And then I will say, okay, Rebecca, I'm so sorry about your kids, but you're still going to have to go and make sure the parent's okay with you missing that meeting. If a parent says, no, we, I don't want her to miss that meeting, then you stop the meeting and you have to reschedule it. Okay, Rebecca? I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. When you were talking about the, all the high school teachers, we had a great uh, person come to one of our meetings the other day that said, yes. please try to find a meaningful person. Yeah, please, when you're choosing your gen ed teachers, pick somebody that has knowledge of the student, that it relates to their area of need, and, and can really be the great gen ed person that you want in that meeting that will really help parents understand how, because they're representing gen ed. So they, are, they need to be able to represent gen ed and be able to address some of those needs and concerns. Oftentimes at the high school we have like seven teachers and guess what, the PE teacher is the only one that's available. Okay, not having a problem in PE. <laughs> And if that person's not articulate and can't really rep truly represent the educational needs of that student in that meeting, you've now chosen the wrong gen ed teacher. Hey, they're doing great in PE, yeah, awesome. How's that helping the parent in the IEP? Not, okay? So really be, um, be cognizant of the kind of gen ed pe person that you're selecting. Now, when we're speaking to gen ed teachers to select, okay? What if I'm scheduling this out and I don't know who the gen ed person is going to be? Say I click on add person and I'm going to pick this Craig, okay? And I add him and I said, okay, I got my gen ed person. What populates to the meeting notice is just his role, not his name. So I chose Craig and then Craig's like, oh, I can't come, Jen, but I found my replacement. It's going to be the English teacher. And she can come instead. And I'd say, OK, that's fine. Do I have to do excusal form? No, because parent is assuming that what role is going to be there? Gen ed. Is English teacher gen ed? Yes. No excusal form necessary because that fulfills her role. So the excusal is based on their role of that person. That's why I'm saying if the school psychologist is on there and they can't come, and they're the only school psychologist, they'll need an excusal, okay? If this moderate needs teacher was going to come and she can't come, but you got another moderate needs teacher that'll come, then they don't need an excusal. It has to do with their role. Parents are assuming that those people from the role will be there. So if we were to take a look at our notice of meeting, you'll see what I mean. It's not based on the person's name. So see? These are the people that are coming. A bridge representative, modern needs teacher, and special ed designee. That's all mom's assuming. I didn't check gen, gen ed, I should have done that. So as long as we can fulfill those requirements, 
No excusals will be necessary. But if we can't, then an excusal form will be necessary. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK, great. So the cool thing is, is Craig says, Jen, I can't make it last minute. I can take him out by taking this gray box and removing him and adding a different gen ed teacher right before the meeting without any problems. Okay, no excusal will come up when I hit the gray box, but excusal will come up for the, for the absent. And the excusal form is quite lengthy. If you take a look at it, oops, they have to fill out, oops, sorry, I wanted to get to that part. Oh, I don't want to see it. Why do I keep doing that? Sorry. Um, this excusal form looks like that. Area of curriculum. Members' area of curriculum, how much time will the member be unable to be at the meeting? And so is this, the, the area of curriculum um, that they cover, is that going to be covered? Yes. Then look at all the things they have to fill out. What are the student strengths? What are the concerns? What are the present levels? What is the student's needs? What accommodations? It's pretty lengthy, isn't it? So legally, we have to provide that information to the parent if they're not going to be there. I'd like this to happen before the meeting, but sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes you find out last minute you can't be there. But if you know in advance, it's our job as case managers to go, oh, you told me you could make it. Now you're saying you got a training? Guess what? Here's your excusal form. Get it done and get it done before the meeting. Your deal, not mine. <laughs> right? Good? And parents have to sign. So if you were to look at what it looks like, parents have to sign this, and it'll say, I agree that the above team member may be excused from the meeting. I do not agree. And then the parents have to sign. Would that be then uploaded? Into and that would be uploaded, yep. Absolutely. OK. So I'm going to go back up here and uncheck her because I don't want to do that excusal form. All right. So I'm going to invite all guardians. So right now, if I check this invite all guardians to one single notice, that means that I'm only going to get dear Mr. and Mrs. Okay? And it's going to be on one sheet. If I uncheck it, then it's going to be Mr. Mrs. So they could go to two different households. Okay? So unchecking two different households, checking one house where it says invite all guardians with a single meeting notice right here. What date was the meeting sent? Was it July 1? What's the purpose of the meeting? Reevaluation. Or I believe there's one that's reevaluation and IEP. Let me make sure. Yeah, reevaluation. Okay? And then we go down. Additional purpose of meeting, you can write in there, but you don't have to. Who does the student contact if they have questions? It's you, so go ahead and type your name there. Who should the parent send any replies to to say, I can't make the meeting? That's you and at your school. And again, we have this record of parent contacts. Sent the notice of meeting. I called parents. Scheduled. What did mom say? Yes, she's going to attend, no, reschedule, do whatever, okay? And I usually check no, I don't want it to print to the docu document, and then I get to this question right here. I don't know if you can't see it very well, but it says, is this a standalone meeting? So a standalone meeting is an other meeting, okay? Other meaning, hey, I want to get together with a parent and talk about the BIP. Or, we need to talk about transportation. It's not going very well, we need to just talk about it. Or I want to talk about goals or services that are going on. Outside of the IEP. Or I'm going to amend it. Outside the IEP. This is in IEP process, right? So is this another meeting? No, this is a reevaluation meeting. So what do you think I need to answer? Is this a standalone meeting? No. When I say no, it's going to reset 
all of the dates from the IEP process, which we want. We want to say, yes, this is a reevaluation, and yes, I want to check it. So it says, is this a standalone meeting? No. Did the student participate? We can't answer that question until the actual eligibility. Okay? So that's all you can do before you're sitting in that eligibility meeting. That's it. Just send the notice. Rebecca? So if you hit, is this a standalone meeting? No. Does that reset dates? Yep. Resets dates. And if you want, if you're doing an amendment, you want to say, yes, this is standalone, because an amendment shouldn't reset those IEP dates, because you're not having an annual review, and you're not having a reeval. So anything that sits outside of the IEP process, like an annual review, a reeval, or initial, that all that sits outside of that should be, yes, it's a standalone, but when we're in the actual process, in an annual, in a reeval, or initial, it's, no, this is not a standalone. Okay? All right, so now let's put, oh, sorry, Andy's got a question. Okay, um, just for clarification, if you could go back up to the participants. Yes. So if we send notice of meeting, yep, and say A, B, C, and D are going to be there, uh huh, and B's child becomes sick, and you need to replace that gen ed teacher with a different teacher. Uh huh. And you click the X, uh -huh. which removes that person. Right. You're fine. You got to add back in the gen the new gen ed teacher. Okay. Um. So you have to replace the person, but if you don't replace the person, then you're in violation. That's correct. Okay. Got to fulfill that role. Can you tell me? Specifically, notice a meeting has to be say, sent. This is law. I need to know exact dates. Law is 10 days. 10 days. Okay. Consent is, so notice a meeting, consent, there's no time frame. It just has to be done before anybody can test, right? That's correct. Which, um, is, which you want to, if it's a reeval, you want to send that consent home 60 days prior to when it's the reevaluation is due. 60 days. I would do it even sooner than that. I would, I usually did, at my school, I think we sent it like 65 or 70 days in advance so that we gave ourselves time because sometimes it's hard to run down that consent. And if I'm, if the IEP, if the review's due, say the review's due by January, or no, that's not a good one, December, okay? I want, and it's December 5th, I want all of November and I need September. September 5th is my 60-day line. That gives me 60 days from September 5th on. But if I wait till September 5th to send the consent home and it never comes back and I'm calling and I'm waiting, I've just eaten up my time and now I'm down below 60 days and now I'm in trouble because I might not be able to get all the assessments done. So if you send the consent home earlier, like we used to, if it was due in December, we'd send those out in mid-August and get that consent back and start going. And I understand, I understand what you're saying, but this is where somebody new like myself to this district gets really confused and a little bit frustrated because there's best practice and then there's law. Law is 60 days prior. Law is 60 days. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's what I need to know because like there are certain things that I found out recently that it's like, no, this has to be sent to the parent seven days in advance. Then I found out later. That's best practice. That's best practice. That's not law. There's a lot of that gray area and for someone. That's right, but as it like, I prefer right, but to as know it, what's law. Right. And then I prefer to know, okay, what's best practice. But I still would like to know what's law. Do you right. know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So like sending an evaluation home ahead of time, that's best practice. Sure. That's district best practice. So you're hired as a district employee, so we got to follow district best practice. Minimum for the law states that you have to provide a copy of the evaluation and the eligibility, and there's no timeline. Law just says you have to provide it to them. And I, I, I appreciate this. Right. 
So I understand that because I was always confused too. I was like, what is, uh, why, what are we doing? So you'll hear the seven days because we say best practice is set at home seven days in advance so the parents can process and go through and you save yourself time. But the law states, all right, so what if that doesn't happen? What if somebody's crunch time and getting their evaluation in last minute? Oh my gosh, and that happens, right? You haven't broken any law <laughs> by not sending it home 70 day, seven days in advance. It's just best practice. Now you're going to have to really talk about that evaluation at the meeting. And as long as you provide copies of the evaluation and blank eligibility forms to the parents, then you've met the law. But 60 days is. So timelines are, if you go to referral, you have 30 days to get the consent for initial evaluation. From the referral, you have 60 days to, to assess. You have an additional 30 days after the eligibility to actually hold the IEP meeting. But most schools will hold the, uh, the initial eligibility and the IEP in the same meeting. But sometimes that doesn't always work out. Sometimes you might hold an eligibility and that parent goes, you know what, and then you're saying, oh, your, your son or daughter qualifies for initial, and they're like, whoa, I'm not ready for that label. Whoa, I'm not ready for SPED. Can I take this consent for initial placement of services home and think about it? This is a big step, me my putting my kid in SPED. And they stop, and they go, I can't do this anymore. Then you have 30 days from the time that parent leaves that eligibility meeting to hold an, an IEP. Best practice is if you shared that evaluation ahead of time and explained the evaluation and said, hey, this is what we're fighting, here's all the evaluation, then we'll talk, and then you have a really deep discussion about eligibility and the parents prepared for the fact that they might actually get special ed services, maybe the parent at that time will go, okay, yes, I want to place in SPED, and then you can go forward with the IEP meeting right then. In a transitional IEP, does the student have to participate in the, the IEP meeting? In, you mean a, an IEP that's 15 plus? In, yes. Yes, it's required by law. Now, I will say they have to be, what's required by law is that they have to be invited. They have to be invited. So it may not be appropriate at every time that a, maybe a student is cognitively delayed and it might not be appropriate for them to be in that meeting. But what's required by law is that you have to document that you got the student's interests and ideas about where they want to go, what they want to do with their life. You have to get that prior to the meeting and put that in there if they're not going to be there. If not, they need to be in attendance. I had, I had a situation where the parents had asked for the student not to be present, mm -hmm. and I just documented that. That's fine, and okay. then you have to, in, and we'll go over that today in the 15 plus IEP. We're gonna go over how do you document that you spent time with that student and said, oh, what is it that you wanna do? Or what, you did a, some transitional assessment and you got their input somehow. You have to document that that way. And I usually document that the parents don't want the student in the meeting, I put that in the meeting minutes. But what you're required to do is you have to invite. So when a parent says, I don't want Johnny there, and I was like, I understand that, but I'm required by law to invite him. Okay, great. Okay, so let's talk about eligibility. So we go through the eligibility now, and we're going down. Now we're in the eligibility meeting. So I'll say that the student did participate. You can say yes or no. So then we answer our regular questions. Has all the evaluations been done? You say yes. What happens when you say no at an initial? when all the evaluations aren't done. Stops the meeting. What are good reasons, or I shouldn't say good, but compliant reasons of why you can answer no there? What's that? So there's only a couple of legal ways that you can say no and still be okay with it. If you're sitting at an initial eligibility meeting and you had 60 days to assess the kid, and the kid was absent for more than 75% of the time, I think it's 45 days, they were absent from school for more than 45 days, that's a legitimate reason why you probably don't have enough evaluation. So you can say that in your reason. Yeah, we don't have enough testing results because the kid was never in school. Okay? 
Is it compliant if, um, let's say, Rebecca doesn't do her job and doesn't do her assessments, and she didn't get it done on time because she was too busy with other things? Can I answer no there? Not legally. We cannot answer no just because someone didn't do their job. Okay, that gets us in a sticky situation when people don't do their job. We have 60 days to do it. So we have to case manage and make sure people are on top of getting their evaluations done. Okay? And what if they still don't? Hopefully you have enough evaluative data to requalify that student on a reeval. For an initial, it could really bog down that system. And if, if you have a team member that's not getting their evaluations done on time, you go to their administrator. We are, she is putting, he or she is putting us at liability by not completing their job. And I can't sit by here and be responsible for that. And there's only one other um, way that you can say no, th things weren't done, is if it, an initial, not a reval, but an initial you're looking at qualification for SLD. If you're saying, oh, you know what? We started this body of evidence, and we started to do this, and we realized we got other assessments that we had to get done, and we couldn't get it done in the 60 days, then you can actually legally ask for an extension. It's the only disability category you can do that for. Other than that, if you don't have enough evaluation and your colleague didn't do her job, then you say no, the meeting stops, and the process starts all over again. And I'd make that person do all the paperwork. <laughs> They didn't do their job, okay? So the process has to stop. At a re-eval, hopefully you have enough evaluative data, okay? Then the next question is, um, the student can receive reasonable um, educational benefit from gen ed. That should be a no. Student's performance is due to lack of reading instruction. This is really hard for truant kids. It's hard. Sometimes you have to say, yeah, I had a, I had a couple of L kids that were not found eligible because they hadn't been in school for four or five years, and it was because of lack of instruction. Just pure lack of instruction. If you had been in school, maybe you might have gotten it. <laughs> so truancy can play a part in that. Students' um, performance due to lack of instruction in math, no. Um, and if you answer LEP, you just have to say, um, you have to say no, but you, you, there is, a student can be eligible for uh, like a limited English proficiency and still be on IEP. You just got to make sure that you um, assess that student in their native language so that you can screen that piece out. Okay? Now this is where I want to show you that Rebecca and I have already had to answer like, hmm, how many of these? Like four of these maybe in the last month. And these are for people that have been using the enriched system but they forget this piece. Okay? If I were to go all the way down to the end of my, my piece here and find them eligible, just by clicking eligible here, it actually will finalize and it'll let you, it'll say eligible. But if I were to go to the IEP, it'll say student not found eligible. And people go, why is Jennifer, Rebecca, why? I clicked eligible. Why, why is it not showing that they're eligible? It's because you actually have to choose a disability category, okay? So let's go back up. And you can help us by pointing that out to people, okay? I'm going to get rid of that so I can go back. So if I go back up to the eligibility decision, look at there. It says prior to the meeting, SLD. Disability is considered during the meeting, what? nothing it's blank and the program unfortunately will actually let you finalize it without choosing one and then they go I don't know why and I'm like because there's no disability selected so you actually have to select a disability okay so you can choose any disability you want yes yeah okay. you can pick most likely you want to pick the same one so then the criteria worksheet will come up. And then you have to check all the areas. Well, so let's say he's really struggling in reading. So I'm going to choose some reading pieces and, math, and writing. But no, he's good in math. And this is for the SLD. So go through and actually check through every piece of your, um, is this an initial? No. Go through the criteria and make sure you check through all the ones that you're doing. And then for the SLD, 
you'll get all these great questions. And then I want to show you something really quick. When I go to print the eligibility determination page, people say, where's the signature page for the eligibility? The signature page for the eligibility is the multidisciplinary team members list. Now, yours, if you didn't pick SLD, will look different than mine. And the reason why is that SLD criteria is the only one that actually makes you select agree, disagree. Okay, do you see that now? Do you see where it says agree, disagree? And you have to indicate that? If I were to go back and choose, say for example, I'm going to choose OHI. Okay, so I'm going to go back up. I'm going to delete this one. I'm going to add OHI, other health impairment. Now if I print this eligibility determination page, if I go down to the page three, look at the difference. See the difference? There's no agree, disagree because it's not for a SLD criteria. This is your participants page for the eligibility meeting. And then you'll have a participants page for the IEP, right? So this is for eligibility, and you're gonna have another one for IEP. So when you have a reeval or you have an initial, you're gonna have two things that are signed, okay? What should I do after I get this signed? Upload it. So Rebecca was just telling me today that Karen Callis is our records keeper, and she's noticing while she's trying to send records to other districts, people are not uploading their signature pages, which makes it an incomplete record, which puts us also in liability. So now Rebecca and I have to go in and see if there's a way that we can make it required, <laughs> because people aren't doing their jobs. They need to upload their signature pages because we can get in major buku problems when not having a complete record. So we have to remember to upload all of our signatures. So you new folks can really help me out and go in that file and check. Once you're in your student's IEP file in production, check to make sure that those signatures are uploaded. Make sure they're there, okay? Yes? I mean, if you think about that and a parent, you know, gets unhappy and requests records and there's no consent to test, signature I mean we that would be we would be completely liable because they would just say we didn't even consent for any of this to happen and it all happened so yeah, we need those signatures, signatures. all right so now I'm gonna go through hopefully you've already gone through and you found a student eligible yes Okay, then at the end of the worksheet, it says, does the student meet the criteria? You say yes. If you answer no, then you'll say the student doesn't qualify. And then you can ch check a primary. And if there's a secondary, then you would just select the secondary disability, go through that criteria worksheet, and then find that and click on um, secondary. So you can add two of them there. Has the copy of the evaluation and eligibility statement been provided to the parents? Yes. Do you notice that there's no timeline on that, Jamie? It says, has it been provided, right? That's the law. Yes. Who provided it? I did. So go ahead and put that on there. Is everybody going through their eligibility with me? And then the date, I'm going to say was, what is our date? 19th. The 19th on a Saturday. Okay. And then the one thing I want you to see is there is a built-in compliance check. So it's telling you right away they're built into each one of the forms. It says you should have had this eligibility done by 321. Right? 26, three years. Eligibility meets the following condition. Yes. So we're set. He really wasn't due for a reeval. I'm just doing an extra one. But the compliance check is built in all the time to make sure that you're doing it on time. So always look for those dates. Okay? And so 
After we do that, we're finalizing this on the 19th as well. This is really date specific because if you put today's date and then you go to actually finalize the IEP and say you wrote the, oop, I missed something. Uh-oh. No. No. There we go. Finalize. Oh, I missed another thing. <laughs> I love how it checks to make sure that you got everything that you were supposed to. Okay, now let's see. <laughs> okay, if you put in the, the eligibility date after the IEP meeting, it actually won't let you finalize the IEP. All the dates have to run before everything in the system. Okay? And we're going to finalize. Anybody else have any questions about the eligibility? Hopefully I'll be able to finalize mine and not get deadlocked. Question. Yes, question? Do you need to you print out the agree or disagree yep. before you finalize? Yeah, yeah, you probably want to print that out um, before you finalize and have people sign that. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You can pick it, you can do it even after you finalize. It'll still yep. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm deadlocked. You don't want to do it before because that is predetermination. That's the only hard thing about the eligibility is that you can't actually pre-populate those because then because you have to get those embedded it within the disability category. Okay, if you were able to finalize your IEP and you are elementary, you can now pick up your stuff and move into this room right around the corner to be with uh, to get your training for the IEP with Kim. So I want middle school and high school folks to stay with me. So for ECE? ECE is, is the same IEP, yeah, you need to go elementary. So what, what high school are you at? Holland Ranch High School. Holland High School, oh good, okay great. With uh, Jeanette De DeSnero? Yep. Alex. <laughs> Alex, love Alex. Not a very good paper writer, but he's super wonderful with the kids, he and he'll and he knows that. I don't know. You can choke really well about that. We're very lucky because just our whole team is our whole school is kind of pretty awesome. Yeah, Jerry used to be my assistant principal when I taught here at Douglas. I love him. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and so was um, who's the assistant principal? I love her too. No, the other one. Julia Kelly. Yes, yeah, she used to be my admin here too. Yeah. And the library media specialist. Oh, Brian is amazing teacher. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. Oh, girls, you're right here. Sorry. You can cut through there. Okay. He does. Okay, so ours is going to take a little longer, so I'm going to try and go through a little faster because there's, there's a lot. And then Judy Jordan, who's the high school um, coordinator, and Elisa Creamer is the middle school coordinator. She can do more follow-up with you, and I think you're going to get a little bit more of this in more nuts and bolts classes about I-13, which is indicator 13 compliance, which is the Compliance piece that we have to look at for a 15 plus IEP, a transition IEP if you're new to uh, Colorado, other schools call them transition IEPs. And Rudy, you're in high school, so you're going to stay here? Or? Well, I'd like you want to go to the elementary? Yeah. All righty. Sounds great. Okay, so let's go ahead and open this IEP. 
Now, the first thing that you're going to get on this IEP, yeah, yeah. I was in an IEP meeting the other day, and I was like, I don't think we want to do this. We, we talk about two least restrictive environments. For the kindies. No, for everybody. Yes, you always, have, okay. yeah. But show them on a kindy. See if you I can will, do an IEP on a kindy, how they handle. Only yeah. Only considered one. I said, you can't just consider one. But then I, thought, oh, I, I know, know, but I don't, we're doc I don't know if people are documenting. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. okay, so what first comes up is um, it says start with a copy. And that basically will try, it'll copy in a lot of the material from the, the year before. So it is advantageous to start with copy when you're doing that. And make sure you're choosing IEP 15 plus. Even though if you're a middle school kid that you're working on, it's not coming up automatically, I still want you to choose it, okay? just for this training part, so that you can kind of see the components of a 15 plus IEP. Can you back up? Did you say start with copy? Yes, start with copy. So I'm going to click on start with copy and make sure this says 15 plus, okay? And then you say next. All right, so what comes up when we're creating this IEP is you notice where it says create meeting or it's like select a meeting to link. You see that? So what it's asking is, did that um, eligibility meeting, did that hold as the eligibility and the IEP meeting? Did you have it all in the same day? And if so, you can just link it in and you don't have to create a whole new notice. But when you're doing the eligibility on one day and the IEP on another, you have to do create new meeting. So we are going to have it all one shoot and match. So we're going to click on select to select and link that meeting together. Now if you linked a meeting together that you probably shouldn't have, like, oh, I linked together the referral and I didn't want to, you can always click on return to meeting list and unlink it. So I'm going to click on select. And if I, I goofed up and I go, oh, I don't want to link it together, I can just click on return to meeting list and it lets me create a new meeting if I wanted to, okay? So I'm going to hit select, and now all my same participants, all my other information already comes in, okay? So now um, I get to this section right here, printing meeting participants. Do you see that small little box there that says complete this section to print the participants? If you don't check that box there, you won't actually get the names pre-populated on the form, okay? So I'm going to show you what it looks like when you don't pick it. So if I go down to my documents and I click on the IEP, and it's page two of the IEP is the signature page. <clears throat> if I go down to the signature page, I want you to notice it's blank, isn't it? No names are there. They don't populate. They won't populate until I check complete this to print out. Now if I go back and take a look, now I got pre-populated names. See that? So that check mark is really important. Okay, so um, were the parents physically absent? You can say yes. Were they able to participate in another way? You could say yes, and then you put the parent's name, and you would say, well, they participated from a conference call or from a video conference, or if they were not able to participate in any other way, no, they, did, they just didn't come, okay? Or you can say they were not physically absent, they were actually there, okay? Always check to make sure that the enrollment, the schools are correct for your service district, service school, all those pieces, especially when you're talking about center-based program kids. Their, their home school might be very different than your service school where you're servicing them. So make sure that those are selected appropriately. Okay, so if you're at a center-based school, like Highlands Ranch is a center-based school for um, students uh, that are deaf and hard of hearing, 
So then um, Andy's going to select their home school where they should be going to school, but they go to service school would be Highlands Ranch High School. Okay? Then the meeting dates will automatically populate. If you didn't finalize something appropriately, it might say pending. But the interesting thing is it'll bring in those dates and it'll reset everything. And you can always check it just in case it doesn't reset. The blue, do you see those dates that are underlined in blue? Those blue dates mean that there was a document that was completed to get me that date. For example, the eligibility created that eligibility date. The evaluation, it created that evaluation date. So all of your dates should be the same as mine for the evaluation date and the eligibility. If they're not 719, then you might not have filled those out correctly. Okay? Good? All right. So we go down and we select the type of meeting. So it's going to be eligibility. So it is a reeval, and the IEP is an IEP review. Okay? And then you scroll down. When's the date that we gave um, procedural safeguards? I think we gave it to them way back at the consent, so I'm going to put 7 1. But you can put a different date, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. People. Does procedural safeguards require a signature, parent signature? No. It does not. Mm -mm. You just have to document that you gave it to them. All right. So what came in is all of the progress, all the present levels of educational performance from the previous year. Okay. I would say keep the relevant stuff and get rid of old stuff. You know, as a high school teacher, sometimes if people are doing copy, 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 you get stuff in there, it's like, really? I don't necessarily care about whether mom breastfed the kid or not. He's a seventh grader. He's a, he's a 12th grader. Unless he's still being yeah, that's an issue. <laughs> but you really should, the present level of educational performance is exactly that, the present level. Now, this is a reeval, so remember how I said that evaluation summary? If you did that really nicely, you could just copy and paste that summary and bring those in there from a Word document, okay? So this is all your present level information. Now for a 15 plus, there is some things that you want to make sure that you have in here and we're going to talk about those. But um, I gave you guidance of what should be in the present level. So please read the guidance when you're working on your first one or first IEP if you haven't looked at it already. It says, this section should in include comprehensive documentation in narrative form of the student's current level of educational performance with references to the most recent evaluations and testing and um, could be like his MAP scores and other scores that you have. You can do test grades, you can do um, other grades, you can do TCAP scores, all the evaluative testing. Should pass the stranger test that's so that a reader could identify the student's needs, goals, and services just from this section alone. How many times have you guys inherited a goal, um, an IEP and you read at the present levels and you're like, I know nothing about this kid. I don't know where he's achieving. I don't know what he need, why he's even in spit. You know, you've read those before, right? So just think about passing the stranger test. If I only picked up this section, could I plan out an IEP for this kid? If that PLEP is done right, I could. I could find goals, needs, services, everything from the PLEP. And that's where it should be. We also require a classroom observation for every annual. So you need to observe the student in their area, and specifically the area of need, greatest need. It doesn't have to be you. It could be somewhere else, not someone else in your team. So if you can't get to them, it's like, oh, Rebecca, would you go and watch Johnny in math? He's really struggling. That's his you know, the math disability area, and I can't get to him during that because I'm teaching. Can you about, I want you to observe how he's doing with the da 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 And she could take that data, and she can watch and give you that stuff to put that classroom observation in. Yes? But you cannot observe them in your 
Um, right. It does. It cannot be in your own class. It has to be in a gen ed class, and that's tough for some kids that are self-contained all day. You can you there there is an exception when it comes to self-containment. If they're all day in a self-contained class, then try and observe them outside of the class, like maybe in their adaptive skill area or out in the community or whatever. Yes. But you know some kids are, I'm sorry. Somebody cannot observe you to get that classroom observation. You should do it in the gen ed classroom. Then I would, looking at your students with um, deaf and hard of hearing skills, I'd see how are they adapting from transitioning going from class to class? How are they interacting with kids maybe during lunch? I mean, if they're with you all day, you're providing all the academic areas, you might want to look at other pieces. But like I said, it's not always appropriate. It depends. It's just saying, like, how are they functioning in the classroom? Yeah, I think that would be appropriate. I think an interpreter can make that observation. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the other thing that you need to do is report out on the old goals. We don't have a way in Enrich, unfortunately, to report out in the progress reporting section of the goals from last year. So you have to do it in this present levels of educational performance. So if I were to report out on the goals, and hopefully I don't know if you see them there. Hopefully they did, but maybe not. So I would just type in right here, you know, goal one, and I can copy and paste it from my goals. I would say goal one, and I would actually copy the exact language of the goal and tell the parent, all right, his goal was to read such and such by 80%. As of today, he's doing 80%. Goal completed. He didn't make 80%. He's at 60 Tell me real data and say, this goal will either be continued, modified, we got to look at why he didn't make it, all those other pieces. So you have to report out on old goals in the PLEP, okay? And I think I updated that in production so it has those guidance there. All right. Also, for 15 plus, there is a section that is required, and if you click on the text assist, you are required as for 15 plus to not only report out on academic goals, but you're also required to report out on progress towards post-secondary goals. So, for example, Mark here, say Mark wants to be a brain surgeon. He's reading at the second grade reading level. His post-secondary goal is to get into Harvard and be a brain surgeon. Okay? Would I answer the first one based on assessments? Mark's post-secondary goals are attainable. He's reading at second grade reading level. Not happening, right? <laughs> okay. So the first option is helping you for those kids that, yeah, your post-secondary goals are pretty in line with where their skills are, or they're getting there. Okay, they're getting in. It's attainable if we get some work done and we work on these skills. The second one says, well, the most t most recent TCAP results or most recent assessments say he's reading and it says indicate that Mark has a blank gap second grade le level hmm brain surgeon at least maybe 12th grade reading level he's got a 10-year gap that he will have to close in how many years he's a senior this year one year that opens the door for conversations with parents it's not saying yeah you're not gonna be a brain surgeon it's just saying Hey, your goal is to be a brain surgeon. You're reading here. This is where you need to be. Huge gap. You have to close that if you think this is going to be attainable for you. It's a nice way of saying, don't think it's going to happen, but it's a great way to get that conversation mulling with parents to say, have we not looked at post-secondary goals appropriately here? Maybe we need to talk about that. Maybe we need to address these gaps. We need to figure this out. Now, the question comes from a lot of my people is saying, how do I know what they need to have for this goal? We have a great tool called ONET. I don't know if you've ever been on it, but ONET is a fantastic resource. You type onto ONET and you can find the career that the student is choosing. And in that ONET, it'll list all the skills that the student needs in order to do that career. And it'll help you identify those gaps for those kids. Where do you find that? ONET is just a, oh, I don't know if it's ONET.com or ONET.org. 
It's no. occupational, what? O-N-E-T, yes, O-N-E-T. We also have other resources in our district from Naviance. And Naviance has a lot of great resource tools in there as well. And then there's also um, careers, I can't remember this, it's something to do with .gov. There's something with a gov, gov and I'll there are transition resources we actually have on the SPED website. If you go to the special ed Google's, um, Google site, you'll see where it says transition resources. If you click on that, there's a whole bunch of transition resources to help you identify those skills and those gaps. So we have to, this is part of indicator 13, we must have that statement in the present levels of educational performance or in the student's needs of impact to disability. I just put the text assist here in the present levels to help guide you. Because you're already talking about data you have from assessments, it makes sense to put this statement right under. Well, based on all these assessments, he can do that. Or based on these assessments, we got some gaps here. That's why I felt it was a good match to put it in there. Okay? Any questions about reporting out on progress uh, towards post-secondary? Yes, Andy. What did you think about that before that? Like this is a brand new student, like a brand new freshman or bra brand new 15-year-old, right? Right, or... If they were brand new, what? If they're either... Uh, Brand new freshman coming in. Just turned 15. Or I'm brand new. And Bra it, should, it, it doesn't matter if you're brand new. If that student had an IEP, they should have had post-secondary goals if they were 15 or older. And you still need a progress report out on those post-secondary goals that were chosen last year. Or currently this year. You can start fresh. You're going to sit down and do a transition assessment with that kid and go, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to be an engineer. Ms. Wolf, I want to do this. I want to do that. And you've already talked. You've got all that assessment data. You're ready to go. You're going to set out. That's his post-secondary goal. Then you start looking at the data. Ooh, sorry, Johnny. Um, let's talk about these gaps here. You want to be an engineer? Guess what? To get into an engineering school, you're going to need this kind of ACT. You're going to need this kind of reading level. And we looked this up on ONET. Look at all these skills. And boy, you're really, you struggle with this stuff. You've got a gap. That's what you're going to do. So it doesn't matter if you're new to the district. You're going to do that with that kid based on what you're planning for now. Same with the ninth grader. You're going to give them transition assessment, and as a ninth grader, ninth grader or maybe middle schooler, they're going to say, I want to be a professional basketball player. <laughs> Okay, great. You know you have to be NCAA clearinghouse. You have to be able to get into a, a college for this. You're going to have to do da, da 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 And you go through these pieces and address the gaps there. So it's the plan as you're making it for now. Okay, and reporting out on goals from prior year. That's going to be tough for you guys because you are new. And I think that data has to come from... You, from the beginning of the school year, whatever data you've collected up until now, this annual review or reevaluation, and then you've got to ask those other teammates, hey, I've got to get some data here to put in to report out. You've got to help me out here. Where would I find that? Hopefully you'd find something in the old progress report from last year, from last May. So I have a question along those same lines. Um, I just had a student transfer in and she didn't come with a lot of data. She came from a different school district. Um, and she will be 15 before her next annuals due. So I need to do a transition on her. Okay. I've been working on it. Now, will I just report out on what we have discussed already? What and you were, so that, yes. So if you accepted the IEP from, let's say. I did not. You did not. So you're doing a brand new one because you did not accept the IEP at all then you have no progress reporting to report out for their old academic goals. Okay. You would just really focus on this piece. Okay. Yep. Yippers. Yeah, you can't really report out on progress that, on, on goals that when they're transferring. Good point. <laughs> All right, good on the post-secondary stuff. That's huge. That was brand new last year. So help your teammates because they're inconsistently doing that. And we're getting into some trouble. So help them, please, high school folks, for sure. Okay? All right, now we're moving on to um, the student um, assessment, transition assessment. We want to see a different transition assessment each year. 
You can give the same one two years in a row as long as you also have a different one, okay? But they must be different. If I saw a transition interview four times and that's all I saw, that would not meet compliance. We need different types of transition assessments. So you add the test in there, and then you actually add other pieces um, that tell me the summary of those results. Okay? Does that make sense? So if there's some in there right now, we're not really filling out the huge body of this. I just want you to be aware that you have to have transition. If you're opening up this for the practice and there is no transition assessment, just add one. You can add it as a transition interview. I'm lucky because all this stuff is in there already. I would update and add one. How compliance works is when they look at it, they want to see that one is done for each year. Has to be done. Just one? You choose any. It's not a bank. It's based on whatever assessment you want to give a kid. It could be, we have, again, special ed Google site. If you click on transition resources, there's a whole host of transition assessments listed there that you can click on and use. We have Naviance, we have Career Interest Profiler, we have College in Colorado, we have, um, what's that one that the 7th and 8th graders all do? College in Colorado. Yeah, the choice choosing something, choice inventory. So we can use, if the... The whole school did it, you could use that right. one. Yeah, right. absolutely use it. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, what a lot of the schools do the career planning with the whole school. Yeah. And so you can use that. Absolutely. Here. Sitting down and interviewing a kid counts as a transition assessment. Hey, what do you want to do? What do you like to do? I like to work with computers. Great. What are you thinking about doing with the computers? Oh, blah, blah, blah. Just an interview in itself is an assessment. Okay, so good about the transition assessment. Now, if you, and see all of these things that she's got in there, because I know this is CV, all of these that she has are all copied from Naviance. <laughs> That whole section was all a Naviance report, which is fine as long as she copy and paste it into a Word document and put it in there. That's totally fine. Okay, student needs an impact to disability. Now, what you have to have, and it's kind of like this is like an IAP review for us, we need to have a list of the student's needs and we have to have a statement that talks about their impact of disability in gen ed. So if we were to read this one, let's see if it would hit compliance. We have Mark's learning disability in math impacts his access to progress in gen ed curriculum, gen ed uh, education classroom. Okay, did we talk about the impact right there? I'd probably want how it would impact. <laughs> I mean, it's a good start. <laughs> it's at least saying it's impacting. I would probably would put a little bit more. Mark has Mark, uh, made considerable progress in listening while number of concerns has decreased. Mark needs support with independent work habits. He exhibits difficulty completing independent work. He continues to have difficulty with tasks that involve auditory memory, rapid changes in topic. Mark inconsistently advocates for himself. So we've identified some needs, but it's kind of like, it's in there. It's, I love lists. I think it helps parents, and it helps you as a moderate needs teacher or, a, or an IEP writer, if you have all of those bulleted, all of his needs, when you get to the accommodations and services section, you can go back down and go, all right, here's all my needs. Do I have a need, do I have an accommodation or a service that's going to address this need or a goal? Do I have something that's going to address these pieces? Because you can go back and see that list, boom, 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 I'm good. And not every need will be addressed. You'll try to, but they all co need to correspond. You can't have a goal that's not identified as a need. Same with a service. You can't add a service without a corresponding need. Okay, it's the golden thread, and I don't know if you've gone to nuts and bolts where they've talked about the golden thread, but you have to have that thread that goes throughout. And it starts from the PLEP, all that data. From the data, you get your needs. Your needs then that are bulleted and easy to read and for the parent and for you, then you take those needs and you go, hey, so we've identified these needs. If I go over to his goals and I can pull up his goals right here, I would say, oh, do we have the golden thread going through this IEP? So I've got a math goal, 
a reading goal, a writing goal, and self-determination. Is there anything in there that says he's got math needs? I didn't see it. Where is it? Yeah, what are his math needs? <laughs> Have no idea. Okay, he's got some reading issues, sustaining attention, writing. I don't know if it really says anything about writing either. Do you see where that, that thread's already broken? His needs do not correspond to those goals, and I don't know what the services would be. Do you see how that is hard? You know, if you can do that, it's kind of cool how we do it. Is we, whatever you write in that needs, you can go off to the left and take a look at your goals. Hey, have I addressed this in either a goal, a service, or an accommodation? Not every need has to be a goal or a service. It could just be an accommodation. So his attention piece, that could probably could be really uh, addressed by an accommodation. Maybe they're doing like some checks for understanding or prompting, making sure he's paying attention. So that could be addressed under an accommodation. It doesn't have to be a goal. But that goal better have a need, identified need. That has to be there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah? OK, cool. So needs. I like bullets, but you don't have to do it. <laughs> All right, student parent input, you just got to make sure that you have input from the parents and the student, okay? Post-secondary um, consideration, I wanted to show you this really quick. Um, I can't get this out of our system because we're on the state system. We do not offer a certificate of attendance in our district. Every one of our students receives a standard diploma, so please never pick that, okay? We are, excuse me, <laughs> standard high school diploma is what you would choose every time. And you try to project out when they're going to graduate. This date doesn't have to be exact. I usually pick like the end of May of the year that I think they're graduating. Doesn't have to be exact, okay? Will the student turn 20 during this IAP? That's for our students that are in our bridge program, our 1821 program. And we have to identify whether or not they're turning 20. Because once they hit 21, they've now aged out of our special ed services. Okay? So, post secondary training goal. So, this is where the kid's gonna be trained, depending upon their, their, uh, tr their post secondary goal. This has to be in an active voice, it cannot be wants to, wishes to, pursues, wa hopes to. We all hope to do a lot of things, but that's not really a good goal, is it? We need action verbs. Will. He will attend. Are we responsible that, for him to attend that college? No, but that is his goal, and it needs to be in an active voice. Mark will attend a junior college. Will attend college. You can make it more specific. Will attend college to study, but whatever. Or he can leave it, attend college, four-year college, junior college, whatever it is. The career employment also be, has to be active. Will work as an auto mechanic. Will work. How about if you, the kid is an eighth grader and they're a screwball? I used to have a lot of seventh, I used to teach middle school tool too. And some of those kids are like, I don't know what I want to do. I want to be a street pharmacist. <laughs> um, they don't know what they want to do, <laughs> right? So I'll say, well, are you, gonna pl are you planning to work? Yeah, I want to work. I want to get a job. You going to work full time or part time? I'm going to work part-time. Okay, we'll work part-time. There's my goal. I have no idea. Hopefully, I'm doing more transition assessment to figure out where, what area. Maybe I can put, we'll work part-time in retail. We'll work part-time in a game store. I can get there. These can change every year. You try and get as specific as possible, but if you can't get that kid there, we'll work. We'll, we'll volunteer, we'll participate in volunteer activities for your SSN kiddos, the low ones. How are they going to participate? We'll participate in sheltered workshop. We'll do those pieces, okay? And then the independent living skills goal is what they're going to do on their own. Now for your mild, moderate kids, we want you to use that language. And it is in the text assist. So we want you to choose, we gave you some guide there. This is the CDE compliant language. That's why we have it in there. So it just says. Yeah, the other ones just say will. 
it'll say John Mark Will, and it's got dot, 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 just to remind you that it says Will. It should be Will. <laughs> So there is a text assist there, but it's not very helpful. So according to current assessment, Mark has age-appropriate skills to live on his own. Therefore, no, no goals are needed. Those are for our mild, moderate students, okay? But for those kids that need more, while living at home, Mark will participate in personal daily living skills such as, and then you would describe. Those are for our more SSN kiddos, okay? So we try to give you guidance on the independent living, but that is the, um, that is the CDE language. Any questions about post-secondary goals? Good? That is I-13. You have to have them. Now plan a course of study. Plan a course of study. If you look at the guidance, it says plan a course of study must be multi-year, three things, multi-year, specific to the student, and tied to their post-secondary goals. So multi-year over the next how many years? Okay specific to that kid, tied to the post-secondary. Mark's post-secondary is going to junior college, he's gonna be an auto mechanic, right? Keep that in mind, here's his plan course of study. Over the next year, well he's a senior, so does that meet the criteria for multi-year? Makes sense, right? One year, he's a senior. If he was a freshman, it should say over the next four years, okay? Mark will concentrate on courses in Math, Science, Engineering, Academy based on his interest in working with automotive. Now, is that specific to him? Yep. Is it tied to his post-secondary goal of being a mechanic? That one phrase alone meets all three, three pieces of the compliance and would actually make this compliant. They didn't even have to write any further, but I'm glad they did. That basically says, boom, this is what he's, courses he's taking. It's tied to his post-secondary, it's specific to him, and it's multi-year, in this case he's a senior. Okay? You middle school folks, you don't have to know what all courses that are going to be planned in high school. But you can be general in saying, over the next five years, six years, so-and-so will take classes in the interest area of art or music or whatever, or all those things. And you, if you really want to get detailed, you can email the other high school and go, hey, do you offer any of these classes? What should I put in the IEP? But don't worry about it. You can make it pretty general as long as it's specific to that kid and it's linked to their post-secondary goal and multi-year. Okay? Any questions about plan course of study? Awesome. You guys are doing great. All right, transition services and activities. Lots of text assist here. Okay? So if I were to click on text assist, this is basically the box that says education and related services. They're saying, all right, what education and related services are you providing to support their post-secondary goal, which remember his was junior college, right? So special ed teacher and gen ed teachers will provide, always has to have the will provide, Direct instruction in the areas of, maybe he's in a team taught math, maybe he's in a co-taught English, whatever. Um, and so in the areas of English and math, in order to prepare him for what? Being an auto mechanic, going to junior college, writing papers at college, uh, making sure he's ready for the math curriculum at the junior college, whatever it is, describe all those things that have to do with the junior college, because that's that educational goal that you're supporting. Now, this is where it gets tricky. If you have everything that's listed here has to match the services, okay? So if you have specialized instruction, which is for your moderate needs teachers, then you have to have something about special education teachers doing that. If you have speech language services, you have an SLP providing speech language, what is she doing to prepare him for junior college? So you have to go in and identify what she's doing. What if you have a mental health counselor that's working on coping strategies? You now have to say what he or she is doing. So if you notice, I have listed them out. So I have mental health will provide, speech language will provide, OT will provide, DHH teacher will provide, whatever, this is again the golden thread, if I look on the left side and I see those types of services, then I better talk about them in these areas. They have to match. Does that make sense? Okay. 
And it's the same for every area. So if I come down to the same thing in career, if I were to check on plus under career, and if I, again, if I have psych, social, mental health, again, how is that OT supporting him being an auto mechanic? How is that mental health provider supporting him being an auto mechanic? So one is about preparing him for the education and training goal. Other is preparing him for the career goal itself. Then if we get to independent community experience, we don't have a lot of text assist here because not a lot of moderate needs kiddos have it. So one of the text assists I built in is, it's okay that parents address these issues. You could also say that the special ed teacher is gonna work on budgeting skills or work on preparing them for their driver's license test. I had to do it for one of my high school kids. He really had a hard time reading through the manual, so that was one of our goals. He goes, I really wanna get my driver's license. And mom and dad work so much, it wasn't, and he goes, I really need it so I can get to my job. So as a high school teacher, I'm like, all right, let's read through the manual. And we went through and we practiced, but that was something, a service I wanted to provide for him. So, and then another, I, I used to coordinate internships. I need an internship, Ms. Templeton, great. So I would put in community experience, I'm providing some internship, connecting them with volunteer hours, connecting them with other wraparound services or Douglas County Mental Health. I'm doing all that to connect them with their community. What am I doing as a special ed teacher to com connect them with the community or make them independent? But if you just have parents addressing, that's totally fine. Does the student require daily living? This is more for your SSN kiddos. And what kind of assessments or what kind of vocational pieces are you going to be providing there? Will agency linkages be made during this current year? If you check yes, I also have built in a bunch of text assist, and Rebecca will maintain it for me now that she's in this role. But I have put the most up-to-date agency linkages I could with real phone numbers, real people's names that are there. So if you're saying that a kid wants to go to Arapaho Community College, I have the Arapaho Community College Disability Services person's contact information, phone number, email, etc. So you can insert that in, they're ready to go. I'm like, oh, okay, here's your information. Arapaho Douglas County Works or anything else. What, Andy? It's in an agencies, agency linkages. Yeah, you have to say yes in order to open up that box. Thank you. So if I close it, if I say no, it goes away. But if I say yes, it's, it's right above the consideration of special factors. And it says agency linkages, and you can click on plus. So if there is some agencies there, that are not listed that you use a lot, that you're like, hey, I see that you're missing whatever. Email Rebecca, I'll train Rebecca how to add the text assist, and she can update that list, okay? Or if you find out, hey, that, that person's not working in that role anymore, can you change her name to so-and-so? We'll help you with that, okay? Good, Rebecca? Just to add on to that, what if you wanted to invite one of those people to that Great, thank you, good segue. <laughs> so, if for 15 plus, if I wanted to invite one of those agency members, legally I can't do that without prior consent from the parents. And when we go through ad actions tomorrow night, we're gonna show you there is a consent to invite agencies. So before you can even start scheduling the meeting, you have to fill out that form, have parents sign and say, is it okay I invite DVR or Rapaho Douglas Mental Health, Rapaho Douglas Works, whatever, to the meeting? So you have to fill out that form, send it to parents, parents say, yeah, that's totally fine. So now I have that, now I can start my notice of meeting. Legally for I-13 compliance, if when we're getting audited and they see that a representative from outside of the district is listed and we do not have the prior consent from the parent, we could be in major problems. Okay? But we can, just to clarify, 
as long as you're just checking. Yeah, if I'm just giving them information, that's not the same as inviting. It's based on the notice of meeting. Yep. Mm -hmm. Do parents have to let you know if they are bringing? No. They, parents do not have to let you know if they bring an outside advocate or lawyer or, or outside agency. They don't have to let you know, but you have to let them know. Okay? And the cool thing, um, the other clarification is that we have School to Work Alliance pro uh, program, which is a subdivision of uh, DVR, Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. It's typically for mild to moderate students with disabilities ages 16 and older, but they typically will look at your juniors and your seniors as they're older, and they help with job placement, job training, other pieces like that. School to Work Alliance program is a district and paid employee. Half her salary is paid by us, and half of it's paid by DVR. So when you invite her, Bryn Goodensberger, yeah, Goodensberger, um, when you invite her to your meeting, that doesn't count as an outside agency because she's paid by the district. Okay, so SWAP is not counted in that. Mm -hmm. But DVR is because that is an outside agency. Good on the agency piece? Awesome. We're ripping right through this. Awesome. Okay, so now we're in consideration of special factors. So if a student has a behavior intervention plan, you would indicate yes here and then tell me where you're actually complete, where you're going to hold, document the, um, excuse me, the location of the behavior intervention plan. You actually, the behavior intervention plan doesn't kick out when you say yes. You have to go under add action and add it. Because we want it to sit outside the IEP so that you can amend it and change it anytime without having to hold an IEP. That's why we pulled it out. Okay? So it'll just say, tell me the location of the plan. Where is it kept and who is it communicated with? Okay? Is the student deafblind? If you have deafblind, then a commu communication and a learning plan will, will show up. And this is typically going to be um, filled out by the vision teacher, okay? Or audiologist, thank you. Um, if the teacher is uh, deaf or hard of hearing, that's going to probably be filled out by the DHH teacher, okay? Again, that's that communication plan. And if the student is blind or visually impaired, also the visual, impair, uh, visual teacher or the audiologist, okay? Does this student require a health care plan? Yes, you need, need to talk about the location of the plan, the nurses responsible for writing the plan, and uploading the plan into the IEP. And they should be at the meeting. And they really should be at the meeting. If you've got a health care plan, absolutely that nurse should be invited. Okay? Does a student, uh, an LEP, again, you probably want to have maybe your ELL teacher there, maybe supporting. How have you addressed the student's IEP goals and IEP services and different pieces with the lab? Assistive technology, devices, and services. If you're having a student that will need to take, to use a computer or some kind of text-to-speech accommodation, on an assessment like a TCAP or a ACT or SAT, um, if you're looking for that kind of equipment or, or that ability to use the computer or software, you would indicate it here of saying student requires a computer or a text-to-speech, but be very general. Rebecca, yes. Rebecca just came from a meeting today. How many? 186? 186 IEPs were written last year that wrote a specific program that we are now out of compliance on. And 186. And that actually includes the word laptop. Yes, laptop. Because that... You don't want to be specific. And it kind of denotes ownership, like when the kid, that kid needs to have right. his Use own... Right. Use of a computer laptop. for writing tasks. General. Don't say co writer, laptop, iPad, tablet. <laughs> okay? Use of a computer for writing tasks or text to speech. Period. No other specific programs. So those 186 will have to get fixed. Yeah. 
I have a question surrounding this because I had um, an IEP that I inherited <coughs> where they put this, and it was just because the student, you know, for like extended writing assignments. Would you put that in here or would you put that in accommodations? You have to put it in four places. Okay. If you're looking to put it, if you're looking to have that student get that accommodation on an assessment, a state assessment, it has to be in four places. If you're just saying he needs it in the classroom, then it doesn't have to be here. But it has to be in four places. I'm going to show you those four places. That's the first place it has to be is under assistive technology. And would a calculator fall under that as well? No, 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 because a calculator is already a re, is is already a standard accommodation okay. on TCAP, and it's a standard accommodation on ACT. It's not something that you ask for specifically. It's already being used. So if that's an issue in your building about having them use it in the classroom, I would address that with the building and put it in the classroom accommodation. But it doesn't have to, it's a standard accommodation. All students get the use of computer. Okay? Okay, so now um, I'm gonna stop and let's take a look at our summative to make sure that we're putting all these elements in. Because I'm talking about a lot, but I don't know if I'm hitting a lot of them. All right, let's go to our IEP component. So we have a notice of meeting, we did that. Um, IEP meeting participants, we did that. Enrollment, we looked at that. Dates, procedural safeguards date, we had that. Present levels of performance, if you have them copied over and there's something in there, that's fine. Name them. Student needs of impacted disability, identify two needs. So you do need to address two needs in your impact and disability statement. Um, transition sections, make sure you complete those sections with listing one transition assessment. I think I told you that. You need one for this year, and I need you to make sure you have those post-secondary goals. We'll do this. We'll do that. Make sure you're writing those in. Okay, consideration of special factors. That's where we are. Add use of computer for assistive technology. So we need to write that in there. I knew I was hitting somewhere. <laughs> so we need to write that in there. Use of computer. I'm in the consideration of special factors. And we're, saying yes. we're saying yes, and we're going to say use of computer for writing tasks. So go to your left side, Jamie, left navigation side, and look to the left and find the consideration of special factors section. Click on that, and it'll bring you into this section. Okay, and then you click on yes under assistive technology, and then type in use of computer. Yeah. Is this where you put all the stuff you get from SWAC? Yes, SWAC will actually write in there themselves. Okay. Um, or you can talk with them about how they want you to phrase it in there. Yes. Is everybody with me on the using assistive technology? Can I move forward? Okay. So right here, does the student require special transportation if you say yes here, then it'll say yes, specify. There's actually a special transportation form that's under add action that we're going to go over tomorrow. Um, but you have to specify that they do require special education transportation and kind of why. Explain it, okay? No, I'm just telling you about that. Just in case you have, just the components is your homework. The components is what I'm going to be checking on your homework. So I don't think I had a special transportation checked off right there. But you said uh, we have to identify two students. Yeah, up in that needs impact dis disability section. So if we go back up to that needs impact disability section right here, this section right here. Whoa. So if you just have needs, if, if you copied forward and there's already needs identified, then I'm all good. But I don't have anything. But if you don't have any needs, if you don't have any needs, then you can just put them in, like needs, um, needs, math, um, I don't know. Does it matter what their current disability is? No, I, no, I just want to make sure you know how to, what goes in these pieces. No, 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 no. Don't be long and specific. Can I just say, like, improves, 
Language needs reading fluency improvement. <laughs> really easy, something like that. Is that what you want to? Just I just want when I'm checking through this homework, I just want to see if there's some needs listed. That's all I need. You can write whatever you want, <laughs> small or big as you want, and there should be a transition assessment listed up there too. And you can just type in transition interview. Period. <laughs> okay. Does everybody have their assistive technology piece in? There are two identified needs and at least something that says transition assessment. I'm not going to be super picky on that. I really am not. You know what I will be picky on? Accommodations. And I'll tell Rebecca when she's checking your homework and I'm checking your homework that if you don't have two identified needs and you don't have all of this stuff, that's not the biggest issue. The issue is accommodations. That's what's been getting us in trouble. So I, I honestly, Rebecca will only check the accommodations. I'm going to say that right out loud because that's the biggest part. All right, so let's refocus back where we are and scroll down to we're at progress reporting, okay? Progress reporting. Is everybody with me? All right, so you have to pick the progress reporting period that is a, a, applicable to your building. If you are uh, high school, it's almost always, except for I think CV, is semester. So you choose semester. Okay, but for this homework, we're going to actually choose monthly. Okay, it's okay, we're not actually going to have to do a ton of it, but I'd like you to choose monthly just for our practice so you can kind of see what a progress report looks like and all that stuff. So choose monthly, but typically you would choose the appropriate one, okay, but just for this practice, it's monthly. And then in this box, it says progress reporting, and it says, Parents will be provided with progress updates at each grading period, October, December, March, and May. I, at a high school, would say at December and May, okay? And I would, in addition, I would say via what? I would say via email. The parent gave me um, permission to email pieces of the IEP and other pieces like that. I would usually put via email because I want them to know in the IEP, hey, this is how you're getting your progress reporting. I'm going to send it by an email. I'm not going to send it home with a kid. I'm not going to give you a printed copy. This is how I'm going to give it to you. Okay? You don't have to put that in there, but I think it really clearly defines it for a parent. Okay? Good with the progress reporting? You Monthly. Yes. Monthly. All righty. So now let's go down to goals. I'm not going to go into goals very much because nuts and bolts covers that quite a bit. But the only thing I do want to cover are some things that I think they forget to cover. When you pick your area of need, make sure you relate it to one of those post-secondary areas. So this math goal, which is when presented with a real life financial scenario, Mark will demonstrate mathematical understanding and reasoning. So that makes sense to be connected with Education, mm, maybe financial. I I would have picked something else. What would you have picked? If I'm working on financial pieces with him, what area does that hit? Education, career, or independent living skills? Independent living skills, or I mean, it could be career. It could be career. It, it could career, be. You know, taking money or. It um, could. I think it could be career because they could be writing, uh, giving bids for. Books, yeah, it could. So. Uh, yeah, giving estimates mm -hmm. as an auto mechanic. Absolutely. Okay? Um, I, you can choose all three. But this is what um, you have to have in a goal, is you have to relate it to something specifically in the goal. So if we keep reading, and it says, in order to manage finance independence independently after high school. Okay? Now, that's related to a post-secondary goal, even though... I mean, it's kind of weak. I'd have to really talk the auditor through this. There were no identified independent living skill goals, were there? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of weak. I would have liked them to put, like you said, financial to, to manage finances and understanding giving estimates and bidding for auto mechanics. I think I would have related it that way. But it's still related, and this is compliant. 
I it's weak. Be, I mean, because I've written a few of these last mm -hmm. year, and it was also like with mechanics and stuff. It was always like you know to understand like the um, the ratio for right you know, or manual or reading or manuals, understanding mm -hmm. the math related to being an auto mechanic. You could be really general or really specific, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so this student is a moderate needs student. If you notice, he has a goal and no objectives. Okay. If this student is qualified to take the co-op, which is now the DLM this year, okay, um, if he's taken the, uh, the alternative state assessment and they qualify where there's a check sheet on the Colorado website, typically it's SSN students that have a significant cognitive delay and adaptive behavior issues, and they qualify for that, they have to have objectives along with their goals. And those must be related to extended evidence outcomes for content areas. So if you have a communication goal, are they taking a communication test on the co No. Math, reading, writing, right? So because this is a math goal and that is a content area on the co and this is an SSN kiddo, he would need a goal and objectives. There's other pieces, but typically, right. typically they're being serviced in the SSN program, and typically they have either and, and not either, but it's a cognitive delay and adaptive behavior. Those are the two. They have to have those two pieces. So you can have a student TBI or something, some showing that cognitive delay and the adaptive behavior issues has to be both. And if you have questions about it, you can talk to your coordinators, and you can also look at the checklist or the qualification checklist on CDE's website. All right, so this kid is not. So if I look at that goal, we're fine. We have objectives. We have a unit of measurement. What are we measuring? We're measuring um, this is not the right unit of measurement. <laughs> so this is wrong. What should it be? What's the unit of measurement that I'm assessing this kid on, this goal? It's got 80% of the time. Isn't it 80%? It's percent, right? What's the baseline data point? <coughs> baseline data point says Mark is able to identify the correct op operation but struggles, but continues to struggle with it. Can, um, can you graph that for me? <laughs> That's a problem, isn't it? I can't graph that. That's great narrative, and I'd like that along with a number, but I need a number to graph. So if I'm saying he's going to do it 80% of the time, what's my baseline? Where is he starting? Where is he now? He can do it right now 70% of the time or 50% of the time. I want the now so I can graph that sucker. Can't graph that. So please have baseline data. Okay? You can have the narrative add too. That's totally fine. That's great. Parents like that. Okay? And then you can have your evaluative me method, and if you don't like it, you can click on add, add option, and you can add a different evaluation procedure, which is totally fine. If you have your own specific thing, you can click add option and add that. Okay? Questions about that? So from here on out, we're really going to get on people about relating this to a standard. We're going to be rolling out some we're going to be rolling out some new training for everyone, not just new people, but old people too, because we do a really bad, especially old people, we do a really jo bad job of relating a standard. And really, when you're planning goals, and I'll just do my little blurb, you should always start with the standard, look at the data that you have. Start with the standards like, oh, here's the standard for seventh grade. Here's Johnny, and he's at fifth. Where's my vertical progression? Like, oh, this is how it's going. And then say, okay, how am I going to get Johnny, who's fifth, up to that seventh grade standard? And now I know where he is. How do I write a goal that will work up that skill to that seventh grade standard? You pick the seventh grade standard. You don't pick it at fifth grade. He's in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. You start with the standard first and then write your goal. But you'll see our old people, don't be frustrated with them, love them still, start with a goal and then they try and match up a standard. <laughs> and you really should go opposite. 
Start with the standard first and then write your goal. You would pick, uh, would you pick under reading and communicating, right? So I'm going to pick reading and communicating. I clicked on related standard. I'm going to start with reading and communicating, okay? It's loading. It takes a while because there's a ton of standards in there, okay? And it's really slow in the de dev site. It's not as slow in, um, not as slow as in the production site. So he's a 12th grader, okay? Oral expression and listening, wouldn't that fall in the communication realm of an SLP? Just, I'm not an SLP. These are the standards for a 12th grader. He will effective, effective speaking in informal and formal settings requires appropriate use of methods and audience awareness or effective collaboration in groups. Okay, so you're picking one of those. He's a mild, moderate kid, so here's the one thing I want to talk about. He's a 12th grade mild, moderate. I cannot choose extended evidence outcomes. Those are for co-op kids. I can't pick extended. Anything with the word extended in it, I can't pick for my moderate needs kids, okay? Now co-op, they can pick all of them, and they should have extended. But for moderate needs kids, I can pick anything else as the standard to take a look at. So I'm going to drill down. I'm going to look at evidence. So I'm going to pick up the evidence outcomes, present information. Um, let's take a look at um, select appropriate technical or specialized language. We have uh, a, a present information uh, present information findings and supporting evidence, all those things. Do you think that you as an SLP can choose this goal and then go and observe and look at all their data and go, wow, that kid's doing that 100% of the time or 80% or he meets, 80% is proficient. Is he doing it 80%? You may not have grade level. And when I say grade level, you might say, he's right there. Okay, and then grade level is, you can now drill back down to the 11th grade standard, which is called a vertical progression. And you can look at the 11th grade standard, and it might say something close to it, and you go, wow, he's really here at the 11th grade standard. He's not up to this 12th grade standard yet. So I need to figure out what skill and goal do I need to work on to get him to that 12th grade standard. You may not have official evaluation that says, I'm at grade level 11, but you know by looking at his evaluation. And the, the testing, a lot of it, you don't have, when you do an evaluation and you're looking at specific language areas, I mean, I'm just being honest. You don't get a lot of the data that is directly related to this. You won't. You won't get it in that standardized testing. You're absolutely right. How do you get it? through classroom observation, through classroom teachers' assessments and assignments and other pieces. So you as a practitioner of an SLP that teaches communication, you should know all the standards for your grade level that you teach. You should know those. You should have them printed out and ready to go and say, you know what, when I go to observe a kid and I'm doing standard evaluation, I'm looking at, I'm thinking of all these standards in mind. When I'm observing that kid, where are they? Are they doing this? And I'm checking in with the teacher. Are they, is he doing this about 80% of the time? Because you're not going to get this from a standardized test. There are some standardized tests and subtests that give you some evaluative data to get to this. But not all of it. I, I totally get what you're saying, but I'll, I'm just like. That's what you're supposed to do as best I know, practice but practicality standards. The is, is that fundamentally, if they have real big holes in language, I have to go fill in that foundation first. Right. And that's what you. And then you'll find that's that when. The, and when you find that, you'll drill it all the way down to where that vertical progression of that uh -huh. standard is, and then you'll say, ooh, this is where that gap is. He's at second grade standard. He may not say second grade in your standardized test, oh, but you'll recognize his skill set and you'll go, wow, his skill set's really at the second grade standard and he's in seventh grade. I need to figure out how I can build up his skills so I can support him to get to that seventh grade standard. And yeah, I got a big gap to fill. And are you going to get all the way to seventh grade in one year? No. But you're going to pick something in the middle that leads to it. Okay. Does that make sense? We'll have more training about it. It's just, I'm just trying to help get you guys there. For this purpose, I'm as <laughs> No. Just pick a standard. Okay. I just wanted to have that conversation.
Does that make sense? And, and our older people are really struggling with this too. So you could just pick a standard, you pick any one, just add, and then you hit close, okay? Alrighty, so now let's go down to accommodations modifications. I'm jumping. All right, are there accommodations modifications? All right, so we got a list here. If we were to look at those accommodations, what's on our list? Do we have to have find something here? Okay, assessment, accommodations. Use text assist to guide you to include the appropriate language for accommodations. All right, so if I click on my text assist, and this is one thing I am going to check, and so will Rebecca. Okay, if I use text assist, and I only have three of them in there, that doesn't mean those are the only three. I just put those in as guides to help you with the language that CDE requires. So if I click on this one, extended time on assessments and instruction and projects or something like that in reading, writing, math, social studies, and science, okay? That's the language. CD wants to know what it is. It has to be in instruction, assignments, and assessments. CD wants those three. And they also want what subtest areas. So what Rebecca and I are going to choose is we're going to make sure that whatever you chose in this box has to match what you're choosing in the assessment participation section. So save yourself a little work. And let's just pick together. We can do this together. Let's just pick extended time in reading. Okay? Let's get rid of the language that says science, social studies, math, and let's just say that this kiddo needs it in reading only, okay? Reading only, extended time. That means this kid needs to get that extended time throughout the year, not every day, but regularly. And you need to document this, and every school does it differently. Most high schools do it in IC. So when a gen ed teacher is giving extended time on assignment, then they will, it's okay, um, then they'll mark it in the comments section in IC. So they'll say, um, I gave extended time, I gave them extended time in that reading assignment and they would put ET in the comments section in the grade book. Okay, so we are documenting that piece. Um, so you have to tell parents, okay, we can put these accommodations in, but if we don't notice that they're using it regularly, they may not get that accommodation on the standard test. They have to demonstrate that they've used it throughout the year regularly. Okay? So if I typed on this accommodation, click down on assessment participation for me. Okay? I skipped over modifications. We'll talk about it in a sec. So I said extended time. What is extended time? Now I want to tell you, access for ELLs, that's access test. It's like the old CELA test. It's an assessment for students of English language learners. So unless your student is an English language learner, you don't have to check that box. So if I'm talking about extended time, what is it? Is it presentation, response, setting, timing? What is it? Timing. OK. I want you to see if I don't check any of those boxes, I don't get any of those choices. So if I come over here and I go, okay, they're going to participate in the regular, and I go over here to pick accommodations, ugh, I can't pick any. It's because I didn't choose anything up above. So it's a timing accommodation. If I check that box, timing, and you guys all can do that with me, now I get all of the timing, I'm going to move up a little bit so you can see it. Now I get all the timing accommodations. So those won't show up until you choose them up above. So I have extended time. Now I can only, I can, I can select it in district, but I have to select it in state as well. So I go to regular, state, extended time. Now if you just do this, you have done your homework. <laughs> this is what we're going to check. We want to make sure that what you wrote in your accommodations box matches. But I also asked you to write text using a computer, right? So let's go back up to the accommodation. I have to put in there, if I did it up in the assistive technology, remember I had to write that? 
I've got to write it here, too. So I've got a use of computer for writing tasks. What kind of assessment participation would that be? Presentation, response, or setting? Response. So it's a response, and it's a response for talking word prediction. Let's call, let's do word prediction. Oops, I said talking calculator, sorry. What if I just said word prediction? Okay? Maybe that's what that kid needs. And I, I need to make sure that I put it, sorry, I made a mistake. Use of computer for writing task in, <laughs> I should say writing. I shouldn't select it in reading, that makes no sense. So I go to my writing, regular. I'm going to choose extended time. I go down, I got to make it match. Got to go to my writing in my state assessment. No, we just said extended time in reading, not writing. That, that's right. right, I'm writing the word prediction. Oh, oh, thank you. I picked the wrong one. My bad. Thank you for pointing that out. It's word prediction. My bad. Thank you. That's what it should look like. So I should have word prediction. So this is the four places. We said it had to go in the assistive technology box. It had to be written in the accommodations box that said use of computer and writing. And then it has to be listed in the text in the district assessment participation, and also has to be in the state assessment participation, those four places. Everything else is three places, but assistive technology is four places. So you had a question? Everything, well, you, I just was just reiterating what you had said. So besides, this, if it's not assistive technology, then there's only three, three places. Three places, yep. Has to be it has to match it all the way. Assistive technology, it always has to have two. Four. Yep. Can I share that? So she said, I'm not really writing goals and I'm not writing really things. I'm writing my notes. Definitely. And that's totally fine. I love that. I saw that on other people. They're like, this goes here. This is what I should put here. This was all here, this is this. Action verbs here. This is totally fine. When we check through, we look at notes, totally fine. If you're not writing a real IEP now, it's okay. okay. Is you're taking notes? Yes. Right, you're going to say goal goes here, make sure it's linked to post-secondary. I'm totally fine with that, okay? I just, I want you to learn from it. It's not like, ooh, I'm going to make sure you do this IEP, <laughs> okay? So for the writing one, because that wasn't something that was in accommodation. Which I went back and I wrote that in the accommodations box. I, I did go back and write it in the accommodations box. So up in the accommodations box, I, if I go back up to my accommodations modifications, I did write it. See, I said use of computer for writing. I did write it in that box. And I did write, check it down in the assessment. And I did check it down in the district and state assessment. Okay? You don't have to do that. I just want to make sure you know it has to be in four places. Okay. I was demonstrating that for you. All right. Yes. So let's talk about modifications real quick. You guys are a bright group. What's the difference between accommodation and modification? An accommodation is something that the student uses to access the curriculum that, yep. that at grade level. Yes. A, an accommodation is something that a student uses to access the, um, the content at grade level. And then a modification is when we actually physically change the um, content. Right. So I say it in a nutshell, it's the how and the what. Accommodations, you're changing how the student accesses that piece, how they're looking at the, interacting with the material, and the modification is the what. You're changing content. You're changing what they have to do. The how and the what, okay? If a student is going for co-alt again, then there must be modifications. There's no reason to go for a co-alt if they're not getting any curriculum modified. So that has to have modifications if you're looking at that piece. Does that make sense? And we modify content, not standards. I hate how it says this. It pisses me off. But if you open this up and you say, yes, there's or modifications, and I've tried to talk to them about it, but they don't seem to listen to me. What standards, if any, needed to be modified? We don't modify standards. <laughs> we modify content, 
for standards, to address curriculum that's at that standard. If the kid's reading in a second grade level and he's in seventh grade, I'm not modifying the seventh grade standard. I'm modifying the curriculum because he can't handle the seventh grade curriculum so that he can move towards the seventh grade standard. But I'm not modifying the standard at all. And I hate how they have that there. You're modifying curriculum, OK? So you would say modified English curriculum, modified math curriculum that would include da da da, da and kind of talk about the modifications that you're putting in place. I have a teacher at school that I work with closely. And so for some of my students, even though they don't require, they don't have modifications on their IEP, so she'll just limit their choices on a multiple choice test. Okay, so that gets a little hairy. Right, that's what. Because so if you're, forth, if so. yeah, and it depends. So if you're reducing amount of choices on a test, if you're if you're taking away content material that they should know, then that's a modification. That's what I said. But I'm if you're curious. if if you're if you're doing like say uh, Rebecca has 50 questions to do and she only has 25. But within the 25, it's the same content material. She's doing it at the same level and the same material. That's an accommodation. But if she has to do geometry, algebra, and all this stuff, and I'm only making her do the algebra, that's a modification. Does that make sense? OK. So it's always about the, so be careful when you're doing those accommodations. Make sure you're not really modifying <laughs> and taking content out and taking that gen curriculum out of there. Okay, so moving on to the um, alternate assessment participation. So if a student is to qualify for alt, the co-alt or LDLM now, you have to choose all three areas. So I'm going to uncheck them real quick. Don't do this on your own. I just wanted to show this to you. So if I select, right here I only have the choices of regular and NA, right? That's all I got is my choices. But once I select all three of these, then I get a check, alternate shows up. OK? So you have to have all three of those checked in order to get the alternate assessment to come up. Now, one of the questions that gets asked often is, Jennifer, do I have to list all the accommodations for the alternate assessment? I was like, no, that's the whole point. <laughs> the alternate assessment already has all these built-in accommodations, so, and they're already different. So, no, you don't have to list those, okay? And if you notice, for you high school folks, there was a section there that says for the ACT and the plan accommodations, plan is the 10th grade um, ACT, and the AP and SAT accommodations. So if you check those, when you go down to the section where it says other, and you say, OK, he's taking the plan test, then you can pull in all the approved college board assessments there. And then if you see where it says 11th grade into the state assessment, you choose ACT. Then those are all the approved ACT accommodations. OK? When would we start doing, when would we start doing those? Would, we, would you put those in? I mean, they have to be in at least a year. Prior or so if, if the student's a freshman, I would put the plan assessment accommodations in. If the student's a sophomore, I'd keep the plan ones in there and I'd add the ACT or SAT or that stuff. And I'd leave it on. I'd leave it on all the way through their years because you don't know how many times those kids have to maybe repeat those assessments. And if you take it off, you're kind of not doing them a service, okay? Um, if you see down here where it says listening and speaking, that's only the accommodations for that access. Remember our ELL kiddos. So most of our kids, we don't check that off. Here's a very important thing. It won't actually let you finalize this until you say yes. Parent has been informed about the assessment participation. This is where you have that candid conversation with the parent and say, all right, we've chosen these accommodations. This is not a guarantee they're going to get it on a state assessment. They have to show that they're using it regularly in the classroom. And also, I want to inform you that Rebecca, she's, she's going to take extended time. In our building, when a student's taking extended time, she's going to do it in a separate room with all these other kids that are getting extended time. And they need to know that she's going to be separated. 
I had a parent that I didn't set, tell them that, and I'm like, oh yeah, extended time, blah, 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 blah. And it comes the ACT, or it was the plan test, I can't remember what it was, and I was like, okay, so I just want to let you know that Johnny's going to go into this room. Why? Because that's where all the kids with extended time are. I refuse to let them be isolated. Okay, ma'am, that's the only way I can do the extended time. So are you saying you don't want him to have extended time? Yes. Okay, your choice. Screwing over that kid, right? <laughs> you really needed the extended time, but mom didn't want to be isolated. My fault for not informing that mom of how things work in my building. I should have said, hey, this is how it's going to work. You cool with that? <laughs> so that's why we have that checkbox of has the parents been informed? Yeah. Isn't there a way to... <laughs> Isn't there a way that hypothetically somebody missed the box and you say to the parent, all, all students who have extended time are here to not interfere so th oh, they're was, not distracted right. by the other students leaving before them. Oh, yeah. It was just because the parent did not want him to go into a special tr testing. She wanted to be in gen ed with everybody else. Mm. And that's what she refused. Mm. It wasn't how we did it, because that's how we had to do it. So I should have informed her. I should have informed her. That's all we have to do. So that's why you have that box. Are they aware of the accommodations? Okay. All right, so are there non-standard? If you say yes, then you can describe the non-standard accommodations. We're going to say no. Are there any other accommodations? We're going to say no. It's so rare that you have those, so you want to talk about that. All right, so now we're down to ESY, and I know I haven't even given you a break, and I apologize, but you, you guys good with bearing through? Okay, we're almost done. So primary so services statement. So in the service delivery statement, you are going to say, um, kind of like you did up there with who's providing what services, you need to say it again. On a 15 plus, you kind of have to say it twice. So service delivery is, student will be in team talk classes, two team talk classes for math and English, will be in this kind of class for this, will be receiving direct service from SLP 20 minutes per week to work on writing goals. We're going to be here. You're really kind of hashing out in narrative form what those services that you're providing to the parent. And you want to do that so that if any way you mistakenly mischose services, and this has happened, where somebody put, instead of 60 minutes, they put 60 hours, and they didn't write anything in the service delivery box. So that parent could have come back and said, you said 60 hours. And there was nothing to go, well, no, I, that was a miss click on my, and here it talks about it in the service delivery. They had nothing written in the service delivery. So we could have been liable to provide all those services. So that's why it's important to make sure that you write that service delivery box, OK? Just make sure that you have something there for parents so that they know. So you want to say? Yes, I am saying save specific time. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yes, you do want to do that because it helps you and guides you. We never, never, never say one-on-one -on -one para. Never, OK? Doesn't say requires constant supervision or whatever. And I do have some text assist there to help you. And this is specific for especially you SLPs because SLPAs are new this year. Um, or a lot, lot of their services are. So if you have an SLPA, or if you have a CODA, if you're an occupational therapist, or you have an interpreter, or you have other supports, and we do have interpreting services as a service selection, but if you're going to have maybe some support personnel, like an educational assistant, or a, um, okay, yeah, something like that. You have to document that in the services section. So we did put that in there. So it says some, some of the speech language services may be provided by an SLPA under the direction of the SLP. And that's why we put it in there, because they're not licensed. You're the one that holds the license. You direct them. They do basically under your direction. But that's why they can't be on the IEP, because they're not licensed to provide that. They are under your license, but they can't do it on their own. So you do want to specify that, so use that text assist when you're putting in those kind of people, okay? 
All right, so primary service provider, go ahead and put your name in there. And I'm told that down the road, they may be taking this out because it's on the programs tab now, <laughs> but I don't know. So just do it until now. All right. I jumped up over ESY, so let's go back to ESY. <laughs> Sorry. Go to your left navigation side and check ESY. So for our homework, we have to qualify one kid for ESY, don't we? All right. So ESY. ESY stands for extended school year, if you didn't know. And um, it says, did the student experience severe regression in, on his or her IEP goals? Did the student require unreasonably long period of time to relearn? Do per predictive factors indicate the need for ESY? So just a really quick piece on, does everybody understand what regression and recoupment is? Mm -hmm. Regression is half the time. You're on a two-week break and they don't come back to their skills within a week. That's called regression. You're off school for two months and it takes them more than a month to recoup or re get those class, get those skills back. That's regression, okay? Predictive factors could be so many other things. And we have a whole entire worksheet that helps you go through each one of those things. And to be honest with you, I don't want to spend our time going through it because how many SSN teachers do we have in this room? Okay, yeah, none. So <laughs> most of our students don't qualify. Some do. Some do under predictive factors. But if you really have questions about predictive factors and those pieces, I'd rather you work one-on-one, -on -one, your coordinators or people in your building, to go through that. And the check sheets are pretty self-explanatory. Every single ESY question has a text assist to help you. <laughs> so you really can't go wrong. But, but I don't want... So what we have to do for homework is we just have to qualify a kid for ESY because I just want to show you how to do it just in case you have to. So you can answer yes, he has regression. So just answer yes and let's say yes and let's say no. We are to qualifying this kid for ESY because I want to just show you how to do it, okay? So we're just saying yes, yes, Okay, I have yes. Whoa, what happened? We have to check yes for the bottom one, wouldn't we? Because that's a need. Yes, yes. So we're going to say yes, yes, no. Well, but we couldn't say no to the last one because it says do predictive factors indicate the need for ESY services. If we said no, then we wouldn't be qualified. We would be done qualifying. Them. No, that's not true. Because you can qualify for ESY under two different ways. So the question is, we have to pick yes for that third question too. Some horse therapy, you're going to do some of these things. Are they going to plan that? And it could be yes or no. Well, we do have to answer it. So I'm going to answer no. And then I go down to the ESY section here. And I have yes. They experience regression recruitment. Yes, they require an unreasonably long period of time to relearn the uh, previously learned skills. I'm going to say no under predictive factors, and then I'm going to say yes. Okay. It says describe ESY services necessary in order to receive FAPE. So what happens for that is that you are not saying. So and so will get six weeks or two weeks of VSY at this time. You're not putting any of that. That gets determined way later. What you're basically addressing there is what services do they need? Speech language, specialized instruction. What do they need? So you can put speech language and call it good. We need to have something in that box. Under describe, after you have your decision of yes, then you're going to describe the service. Okay, you can say SLP, <laughs> speech language. That's fine, but you do have to describe services there in order to give them their fate. You don't talk about specifics of times and dates and how many hours and stuff. That doesn't, that happens later when they are determining and setting up ESY, okay? Now, this is the cool thing. I want you to jump back up to one of your goals. Look what just came into my math goal. It says, ESY, yes or no? Jump back to your goal. 
So once you determine a child for ESY that they're eligible, then you have to go back and choose the goal. It wasn't there before, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't until you found them eligible do you have to go back into the goal and say, yeah, this is the one I need to work on, okay? So um, I'm going to say, since we said speech language is what they need for ESY, I'm going to say a no for, reading, no for math, and I'm going to say a yes for reading, and I'm going to say a no for writing. If yours don't have, don't worry about it. Just pick one. Just pick one that you qualified them a yes for ESY. Just pick one so that I know that you went back and you saw that they needed an ESY. I just wanted you to see that if you did ever qualify a kid, you've got to select the goals you're going to be addressing in ESY. Does that make sense? Okay, where are we on our summative assessment? <laughs> oh, we're almost done. Okay. So, services. So, let's jump down to services. So, we're only going to pick one service. I want to identify services with you and kind of talk about them and what we offer in our district and what we don't, so please don't pick these things. I can't get rid of them because it's the state model. Um, we, don't all, we don't put adaptive PE as a service because that's a class and um, it's just in the student's schedule. We just don't offer that as a service in our district, okay? So please don't pick that. Assistive technology services, we do have SWAC, but we don't offer them in the same way of services. We don't document those on the IEP that way, so don't choose that as well. Audiological services, we do offer those. Um, counseling, we don't. <laughs> DH uh, H services, we do. ECE services, they'd like you to choose ECE, uh, early childhood special education. Um, Annie, we have interpreting services that we do offer. Um, occupational therapy and orientation and mobility we offer. We do not offer parent counseling <laughs> and training. And we do offer personal care services. Um, those are typically for our high needs kiddos. And so that is a, a service that we provide. <clears throat> Physical therapy we provide. We do not provide psychological services. We don't. We do provide social emotional skills development. So that old mental health service that you might be used to from your other districts, that's our mental health, is social emotional skills development. Specialized instruction is what we typically, as moderate needs, SSN, SED teachers provide. And by the way, a moderate needs teacher or an SED teacher could also provide uh, social emotional skills. That's fine too, okay? Um, speech language services, only one person can provide that, and that would be a SOP. Right. Transition services we offer, we have an 18 to 21, and we also do not, do not choose transportation on our IEP as services. We do that through our documentation of special transportation. So is that pretty clear on that? Here's one thing that always gives us a great discussion. Um, Jamie, you're an SLP, right? You know what I'm going to talk about because this is a hot topic. <clears throat> so um, we went through and we checked in with, um, it's not, it's Ash, Asha, Asha. We checked in all the way up through to Asha, and Asha did say that a speech language, um, <clears throat> a speech language pathologist can provide specialized instruction and can provide speech language services. They can provide both of those. They're not limited just to SLP. But an SLP is the only person that can be both a related service and also a, um, <clears throat> a special education service. And that it's up to that special ed or the special speech language pathologist to choose when they're related and when they're special ed. And typically it has to do with communication goals and things that are supporting the speech language piece. That would be special ed, especially if the kid's SLI, but if they're related pieces that an SLP is supporting that may not be directly linked to the SLI stuff, then it would be related. But Linda Neiman is our SLP lead, and she'll help direct you on when you choose related, even though she disagrees that it should not ever be related. Um, Asha says it, it definitely can't be. So we clarified that. <laughs> so if you choose 
Social emotional skills development for mental health, I always want you to choose mental health provider. And why I ask you to choose mental health provider is because our psych and socials split up their caseloads. And if you just put psych, that poor psych, she'll have all of them. And that social worker's like, sweet. <laughs> okay, so put mental health providers so they can divide that up. And a lot of schools don't have both. Some only have one. And so if you put one, then we're kind of screwed. So you need to put mental health providers so that anybody could be providing that service. So mental health. If I were to choose mental health, I have it automatically set up that they are a related service, okay? It's not here in dev, but in production, when you choose mental health provider, you don't get to choose whether it's related or not. It automatically says related, okay? Special ed learning specialist, specialized instruction, we're always special ed. We're never related. What's another related service besides SLP? OT? PT? Okay, those are related services. All right, pick one service, please. And then you're going to pick, you're going to decide. So you get to decide direct and indirect. What's the difference between direct and indirect services? Direct is in a special ed environment. Mm. So, so I'm talking about for my kids. Yep. Direct services is a TOD who signs in their classroom teaching them social studies in their native language which would be signed. Okay, so let's clarify this, okay? okay? Direct service is when you or your para or your assistant or your SLP or any PA or whatever is working directly with the student. Okay, I'm not talking about where, I'm talking about what. Directly with the student. That's direct. Even if it's an educational assistant, even if it's your SLPA. If they're sitting down working directly with that kid, that's direct service. Indirect is if I sent my para in to talk to the gen ed teacher about the student. And that para is never working with the student. They're just going and supporting the gen ed teacher and saying, hey, how is Johnny doing? How are things happening? I'm consulting with a gen ed teacher. Hey, I want to make sure I'm doing these accommodations, modifications, whatever, blah, blah, blah. That's indirect. Indirect is always consultation. Direct is working directly with the kid, okay? Outside and inside, inside would be where? Oh. Gen ed. Yeah, gen ed, right? Inside is gen ed. Outside is sped. What's pull out? Outside. outside. What's push in? Inside. There you go. That's why it's push in, pull out. <laughs> outside, inside, <laughs> okay? So just remember your settings, and if you're working directly with the kid, it's a direct. Now, one thing I need you to know, we all have had them, I've had them myself, where you have those students that you're at the reevaluation and you're like, oh man, I so want to just not qualify this kid. They're right on the cusp, they're almost there, but man, they're moving from seventh grade to, or eighth grade to ninth grade, and I'm so worried they're just gonna fall apart when they get to high school, or I just don't know if I pull out all that SPED service that we're having, I just don't know if they're gonna make it, right? We've had those kids, you just don't know. And so you err to the side of caution and say, oh, I'm gonna requalify and yeah, I'm gonna keep them, but I wanna do consult only, okay? You can't have just indirect only for that kid. You have to have at least one direct service. And you can have at least direct service for 30 minutes. So I don't want to, I don't want to staff this kid out SLD. I just, oh, I just want to make sure they're okay. You know, it's my sped mom and me. <laughs> I just want to make sure they're okay. So I'm going to say direct, but I'm going to say 30 minutes monthly. Wow, 15 minutes every two weeks. Is that so hard? Hey, how's things going? I just want to make sure everything's going okay. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm working directly with her. Mm -hmm. So it's direct. Okay, I can't have just an indirect. We had, we had quite a few the first year I took this position, and we got dinged for it. So we can't just have indirect. We have to have at least 30 minutes of a direct service. Now, I can have direct service, specialized instruction, 
But Jamie, as an SLP, can, she can have all the indirects she wants. She doesn't have to have a direct. What I'm saying is you have to have a direct service. Somebody has to be giving this kid direct service. You can't have them all indirect. Okay? She can be indirect till the cows come home. But as long as we're providing some kind of direct service, totally fine. Does that make sense? Now, if you're a primary service provider, thank you. If you're a primary service provider, you better be providing some direct service. <laughs> Absolutely. Except, except, I'm going to time out on that one. Except the fact that DHH teachers and vision teachers, they are not in the schools often. <coughs> and sometimes their, their services might be indirect, but they should have at least some direct that 30 minutes of saying, I'm checking in with that kid at, at Douglas County. I got to make sure at least 15 minutes ever, hey, how are things going? I just want to make sure you're using all your amplification processes right, blah, 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 blah. There should be, if that's their primary is DHH, and they're an itinerant teacher, their kid's not in a center-based school, that DHH teacher should have a minimum of 30 minutes of direct service. And all the rest can be indirect because they're going to be coordinating with that, all the other pieces. And there might be more services from a learning specialist than actually a DHH teacher, which is fine. But it has to be something. If you're a primary, the primary has to have at least minimum of 30 minutes direct. Yeah. If you're a speech language, okay, speech language only kid, and they're transitioning, like they're doing really well, they're at the end of their little sped career. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, they don't need the direct service time. You're just keeping tabs, but your primary, you still need to have the 30 minutes direct. With yes, them, right? that's correct, to keep them on that IEP, yes. Okay. All right, so everybody picked a service, pick a direct and or indirect, just make sure you pick a location. ESY, you can say yes or no, doesn't matter. Amount, you can say 30 minutes, and I'm going to say weekly, okay? Going down to the very bottom, we're almost done. So the least restrictive environment. The cool thing is, is if you keep going down, the program automatically calculates your LRE. So based on that service of 30 minutes direct outside, the kids get 98.44%. They go away, they, they do all the calculating for you, okay? So then I would choose 80% of the time, okay? But moving back up to the LRE description, which I think, these, I think these boxes should be opposite each other. I think you should see the percentage and then see this box. I don't like how it's configured. So considered, we might consider more time. So you always have to consider something different from the actual LRE you're choosing. So I'm going to consider... 40 to 70, okay? I'm going to consider more time, but I'm going to say, was this option selected? No. And then I can just write my text. I would probably give me a reason why I didn't pick it. And then I would click on add. And then I'm going to choose the actual LRE the kid's in. Was this selected? Yes. Why? It best fits the needs of the kid, blah, blah, blah. Okay? text. But two need to be always, you always have to find another option. So you can find an option of gen ed always, or you can find something more restrictive. But you have to consider other options. You can't just always pick just the one. Does that make sense? Okay, one of the other things I want to show you really quick, and then we are really done, is <coughs> you high school and middle school folks if I have a service, I'm going to, you don't have to do this, I just want to show you how to do it. If I have another service I'm going to add here, I'm going to add specialized instruction, okay? And I have specialized instruction, and I'm the uh, moderate needs teacher, I'm providing this, and I'm direct um, inside the classroom, because the student is inside the classroom, and he's getting 60 minutes, because I'm in that team teaching, with that kiddo. And it's during, um, it's during this first semester. But second semester, our model at our school says, 
I'm not Team Gigi the second semester. <laughs> Uh-oh. Rut row. How is that kid going to get their service? And you are going to say, well, we're really going to try and get her to be good. Because our plan is, is that I'm going to provide all this support and services and helping this gen ed teacher to get on their way with team teaching. And then I'm going to pull out and see if she can maintain those pieces. Well, now I've just changed that LRE, haven't I? Because now I was in there providing the 60 minutes of push in or whatever you want to call it, co-teach. And now I'm not going to be in there anymore, giving her that 60 minutes. So you can actually change the service delivery options and the times and the placement LRE within an IEP if you can project that far out. Sometimes you can. High school, we typically will know first and semester. And sometimes they change. And you can amend it. You can amend by adding these pieces. But if, how if I knew for a fact she was, I was no longer going to be in that class providing the 60 minutes of direct inside. But now I find out that, wow, she really is struggling. And I got to pull her in my, into my special ed class. Because she's not one of those kids that's going to make it when I pull out. She's going to have to come into my, moder into my specialized um, uh, self-contained class. So now I'm going to go direct outside. Now, what I would say is, this one's going to end, and I'm going to end this service. Do you see where I'm in the schedule? I'm going to end this service in December. I'm going to end it December 31st, 2014. Okay? Uh, I'll say the 26. No, you don't have to do this. I just want you to watch because you're going to be doing this in, when you're doing your level matriculations, but don't worry, I'll give you training back then. But then I'm going to start this sucker. I got to start it the very next day. So I said it ended December 26th. So I'm going to start this the 27th, which is probably not a really good date. But now I'm going to do 40, excuse me, 60 minutes outside, direct outside the classroom. So I'm going to do minutes and weekly. What I want to show you is, OK. Here's the placement date at 721. That's where, now her LRE didn't change, right? Because direct inside, inside does not affect the LRE, right? We can be given a gazillion amount of hours inside the class. Doesn't affect the LRE. Outside, it does. But look what happens when I click on this add pla placement date. Watch. When I add placement date and I pull it in for that December date, which I said was what, the 27th? Okay, look how the LRE changed. Now the percentage is not, well, it may not have changed so drastically, but the minutes did. And if I had added so many things, it might have changed the LRE to 40 to 70. So I can build that into my schedule already and know, so the parent knows, okay, I have this amount of service this semester, this amount this. This is the same exact way we're doing matriculations at the end of the year when we take that eighth grader and move them up to the high school. We actually add a placement date for what starts August 1st. Or when they're going from elementary to middle or pre-K pre to kindy. This is how we do it, by adding that placement date. You don't have to do it. I just wanted to show you as like a precursor to what you're going to get. You'll get more level matriculation training later when we get closer to that time period, OK? All righty. Last part. Prior written notice of special action. You just need to make sure that you fill this out, what options were, were discussed in the meeting. You have to fill out the PWN. So that's text, other factors considered in the IEP development. You need to put that. You are the case manager. So select yourself. And you come down to, did the student participate in the meeting? This is that. A uh, question that Jamie was asking about, um, the requirement is you have to invite them. It's a yes. And we do that all we have, to, you know, we went over, I should have showed, I don't know, I think I showed you that. But up in the notice of meeting, should the student be invited to the meeting? Yes. I think I defaulted it to yes for all 15 plus so people wouldn't screw that up. But down here on the participation section, um, if you say, let's see, ugh. If I say no, the student didn't participate, like that parent that didn't want the kid there, see what pops up when it says no? It says, 
describe the steps taken to ensure that the students' preferences and interests were considered. considered. Thank you. So, so mom didn't want them there, so there yeah. it was? So if you say, you can decide. Okay. This is practice, but I wanted to show you. If you say no, kid wasn't there, you have to document here how you considered all those pieces for this IEP development. I sat down with Johnny uh, t two days before the meeting. He told me he wanted to do blah, 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 blah whatever. Okay? That's where you document that. What if Johnny said, I want to be there? And mom well, said Johnny has wanted. the right to be there. This is for him, not his mom. Yeah. That's what I would say. Okay. Do you want something in every box, or can some actual so boxes this be blank? Great question. Thank you. Jamie, you're so awesome. All right. This is what I want to do now. I want you to click validate. And validate is going through and going and scanning through all your IEP to find out what the basic points are that you have that you didn't get, that you didn't fill out. And if you put the word text in it, I don't care. So I'm missing two. I'm missing an explanation and a placement option. <laughs> so I need to go back into my IEP before I finalize to find those spots that I didn't I didn't finish. So I got to go up to extended school year. Oh yeah, I didn't put anything in that box. I got to put text there. And then LRE. Oh yeah, I didn't pick a I didn't pick a placement option. See where it's red? It's telling me. And now if I validate again and they go through all validation, hey, I got everything that I need, so then I'm ready to finalize, okay? Validate just kind of helps you guide through and make sure you filled out all the required components. For your homework assignments, we did them all. We did them all together. We did the services, the ESY, all those pieces. I'm validating because this child's IEP was actually a 12-year-old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Save it and email me. Put it on the summative assessment. Just save it. Okay. And then Rebecca and I can check it. <laughs> They're like, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> That's fine. We've, met, we've got to that before. So I, like, like her, I didn't write both, and I made notes to myself. Is that possible? Totally fine. Yep, totally fine. Th that's fine. Okay. Totally fine. I truly am just going to check your accommodations. Okay. And I want to see that you do have pieces in those boxes. We have a lot of them to check. Rebecca might be more picky about those pieces, but we just want to make sure you understand gotcha. them. If you're writing notes, then you're obviously paying attention, understanding what's happening. And that's, what, that's the out. goal. After we fix things, do you want us to finalize this? Or do you want I'd like you to finalize it, yeah, if it'll let you. Didn't for me. So are you getting an alternative assessment worksheet issue? Yeah. Oh, okie okay. So how about you all just save it because that's a problem with our training site because it hasn't been updated with the alternative worksheet that is supposed to be re... I noticed that in production and I noticed it's not here in our training. So um, all of you save and now go to your summative assessment that you shared with Rebecca and I. Remember that, that document, the Google Doc? You have the paper version right there. You have the Google Doc. Yes. Put that person's name on it, because it's not going to finalize, and we can't approve or reject. We're going to have to look up that student. Or you can email Rebecca or me, or, but I'd rather you put it on the summative assessment. I think you already added that kid's name, didn't you? Yeah, you, you know what? You guys already added the names, right? You did it yesterday. Yeah, then you're fine. The student's name. Yeah, we did look right here. Yeah, if you already added it, the student's name on there, you're good to go. Your assignments are going to be due before, what do you say, Christmas, Rebecca? Is that good? You got till Christmas to finish all your assignments. So we'll do a lot of, we'll do two tomorrow. We'll do one in class tomorrow. And so you basically have an initial to do and another transfer to do is your assignments for most of my folks. You mental health folks, you got to do a whole BIP and FBA on your own. You ECA folks, ECE folks have to do a whole special eval on your own, okay? Everybody has to do the initial, and we're doing that tomorrow too. Yeah, make sure you signed in. So we'll finish the initial, the IEP amendment, progress reporting, and transfers tomorrow.